I think good evening to all. Uh, shall we start now, Pr Prana ma'am and uh, Amoli ma'am? Yes, ma'am. I think we should start because ah, the yes, yeah. yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We have uh, uh, good, good. Uh, no problem. Yeah, people will be joining anyway. So we can go live now. Yes. Oh. Yes, Amol. We can go live now. Okay, okay, okay. Fine. Uh, also, uh, should I please recording switch on and then I would ask uh, anchors for the day to begin the program. Yes, ma'am, starting the recording. Okay. okay. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, depending upon the time zone from where you have joined us today. This is Shatakshi Vishwakarma. And this is Shritama Sengupta. And we are student members of Symbasis Institute of Computer Studies and Research, IEEE Student Branch. We would like to welcome all the participants, guests, volunteers, and all the faculty members to the third day of IEEE Region 10 EA-sponsored Capacity Building Workshop Education 4.0, Role of Educational Technologies, hosted by IEEE SICSR Pune Student Branch, Educational Activities, and Education Society of IEEE Pune Section, in association with Educational Committee of IEEE Delhi, IEEE Madras sections and IEEE Nagpur subsection and is supported by the EAC IEEE India Council. Before proceeding to the session, I would like to take a minute here to refresh you with the rules. Please use the chat window for any remarks or queries, which will be taken by the speaker at the end of the session. Your mics are by default muted to maintain the decorum of the session. We hope you will cooperate with us accordingly. With this, we would like to commence with the day three of Education 4.0. As our first guest speaker, we have Mr. Pinu A. Rajagiri with us to speak on the topic Content Development and Archiving Tools for Research. Mr. Binu A. is an Assistant Professor at Department of Information Technology at Rajagiri School of Engineering and Technology, Kochi. He is a doctoral student in Department of Computer Science, Cochin University. I would now like to welcome Mr. B. Nue and request Sir to deliver his session. Hi, everyone. And thank you very much uh, for inviting me for such a great event. So, uh, I'm very happy to be here to address the gathering about uh, discussing something which is related to content development and content uh, uh, archiving. Okay, I hope it is visible to you, right? Yes, yes sir. So uh, today the topic is uh, something related to content development and uh, content archiving. So uh, it's a uh, short session. And so I'll be discussing some of the topics which is related to very relevant for uh, research and educational academic uh, purpose. So like we know that uh, the research cycle, like uh, whether it is academic uh, side or whether it is a research side, we know that what exactly is going to be the research uh, or the research life cycle, which is part of our life. So it is going to be a continuous activity, like it is not a one time or two time activity, it is an iterative activity. So always we have to be uh, following the cycle which is mentioned here. 
So when you go for that such kind of a cycle, that is uh, every time you are migrating from one research to topic to another research topic. So always you will be collecting so many huge amount of data and all this data is organized in a such a way that uh, we commonly use the uh, for, for hierarchical folder structure where you put something like uh, uh, something uh, which is relevant, something like uh, topic wise, then uh, you will be creating uh, subtopics and within that one, you will be updating some date wise order and put all the documents which you have downloaded, collected uh, from internet and other domains. So that is a commonly practiced approach. But imagine that uh, that is, is it a viable or the best available approach? So like uh, you, you, for a particular uh, individual, like those who are actually having the, uh, on a career like uh, uh, academic or the research initiative, so like it is going to be a continuous activity. It is a kind of iterative activity. So we have to uh, archive it. That is it's something similar to maintaining a digital library. So maintaining a digital library, if you look at the concept from the digital library or digital uh, uh, repository uh, point of view, you will be putting the document only for one purpose. Like uh, you will be putting the document uh, in a repository along with uh, you will be adding some metadata information. But beyond that, for the research purpose, it has got some additional information to be added. Something like uh, 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 you will be putting something like a note related to the document which you have referred. And uh, sometimes you, you can see that this information may be referred in a publication or the document which you have prepared and we need to cite it. So for all this stuff, uh, we need to have some addition functionality that is beyond the uh, uh, functionality which is related to the digital libraries or the digital library that is commonly available, something like the install on similar applications. So how we can go for the uh, concept of archiving in a research domain? That is going to be the first topic which I am going to discuss. And second one uh, automatically comes to the content development. So content development means uh, how it is not related to the uh, data you are creating or how you are writing the document. Beyond that, what are the tools which we can explore, explore for improving the content development or improving the time span of the content development? That is, we know that uh, we develop some content and uh, we draft the document in a such a format that is uh, as per the requirement of the conference uh, proceedings or as per the uh, requirement of the journal publication, then immediately you are getting some responses like uh, your uh, document rejected. Immediately you have to switch, switch maybe one from IEEE, maybe you're switching from IEEE to Springer, then suddenly you have to uh, redraft everything as per the template given by the, that particular uh, publication. So that is going to be a time consuming or tedious task. So what is the best possible option? That is to how to reduce the uh, overall time to develop the document. So one option we can consider in that domain is like a commonly adopted model is web applications or library office kind of an application for uh, developing the document. But if uh, you want to switch in between, the best available option is LaTeX. So LaTeX means uh, for installing LaTeX in a in a PC is not an easy task, even though it is an easy task, but during the compilation process, you will be finding a bit difficulties like uh, packages are missing, some libraries are missing, then we need to fix it manually. So all this comes uh, when you try for th those kind of uh, LaTeX based applications. So always people uh, always looking for the best approach that is best approach in the sense a less time consuming approach to develop such kind of an application. So based on that, based on that, we just need to discuss some of the topics that is what all the tools which we can extend for research uh, uh, content archiving and content development. So today we are going to have a uh, uh, discuss, uh, we will be having a discussion about uh, mentally that is uh, a literature survey and reference management tool that is almost we can say it as a digital provisional assistant. Uh, then uh, we have got the document editor that without uh, having worry about uh, the so-called structure or the template uh, uh, concerns, we can go for, for a simple development, a simple document development, something which is known as overleaf, one application which is known as overleaf, and the second one uh, typeset uh, which is uh, completely AI driven application, but it is a proprietary tool. And uh, then in, along with the content development, then the second choice is how to develop, how to um, develop the diagrams more attractive. So we have a number of tools like the DIA is there, then similar tools are available. Uh, even you can try for the traditional uh, applications like Word applications, PowerPoint application in 
um, uh, Google, Microsoft itself, there is a Visio application. So you have the option to use all those stuff. But if you look at the most of the publications right now, it is more colorful. That is uh, including more stuff related to the icons and uh, related icons and all those stuff. So how, how we can incorporate all these things in the diagram representation? So here I'm going to introduce uh, uh, one tool that is Creately, that is again properly, but the thing is that if your uh, uh, lab having enough fund, these tools are very useful uh, for content development. So first I'm going to uh, discuss about Mendeley. That is, it's simply a, a kind of a demonstration session. I will be demonstrating all this thing. Uh, we'll try to uh, limit the entire demonstration within our with, within the time queue. So first, uh, I'm going to uh, give you an overview of uh, Mentally. Mentally application, uh, it's uh, right now it is uh, available in the internet. It's part of LCV right now. So mainly having multiple applications, like I, right now I'm using desktop application and uh, it has got uh, a cloud-based application that is known as mainly reference manager. And uh, it is also having a web application, web interface, like a mainly web interface. So you have the, you have got a number of options to access it. So right now I'm using desktop application. It is something similar to Google uh, Cloud or Google Drive. That is, uh, you have got a Google uh, Drive client in your machine, and also you have got the uh, cloud service running. So whenever you update some data in your cloud or in your do local document, automatically that will be synchronized to the cloud environment. So same thing applicable in this domain also. That is, you can see that whatever you I update over here, that is, I have multiple options to include the data. I can import the data. I can import the file. I can uh, make a folder as a watch folder. So whatever be whatever I do or whatever the files updated in that folder automatically that will be included to this library. So this library is uh, capable to uh, search as per the given set of documents. I can search it using keywords. I can make it uh, make, can do the search based on some other parameters as mentioned here. So right now it is showing all the uh, listed documents that is part of the this uh, repository. And uh, even I can have, I can maintain my own uh, file sections. So like you can see my own file sections are maintained here. Then if I'm uh, like uh, one document which I referred, like uh, uh, if I am referring this document, you can see some of the metadata information that is these are known as metadata information. That metadata information is missing here. So if you are finding some uh, issues with metadata information, like uh, let me check the, uh, all the metadata information that is uh, this one is completely available then this one is missing this one is missing and this one is missing okay so if you are finding any difficulty based on the metadata information one thing is like uh, you need to identify doi that is by referring that document uh, from the original uh, repository that is original repository means uh, it could be IEEE, it could be Springer. So based on the repository, you can find you can find the document object identifier that is a unique identifier for each and every object uh, or document uh, in the public domain. So looking at that uh, repository or that DOI ID, you can import, you can by clicking on this lookup, you can import almost all uh, details associated with that. If that document's uh, metadata is clearly updated, you can fetch all those details. So that is uh, one advantage of uh, having this kind of an approach, like uh, here I can update this information, so it will be updated. So the thing is that uh, you have downloaded the document and uh, you don't need to update any metadata information. By default, the PDF file which you have downloaded will have necessary information, metadata information. Metadata means all the title, year and publication, etc. But beyond that, if you are looking for an additional information, you can try for the other option, like uh, you identify the catalog ID. If it is all already there, you can try for the uh, lookup operation. Otherwise, you need to identify, then update that catalog uh, DOI then you can update all those information. That is one side of the uh, enriching the metadata information. Then after updating, uh, after uh, including all those details, I just want to verify, uh, read some document. So there is a built-in reader associated with this uh, mainly tool. So there is a reader 
and along with that reader you can find there is a section to add your comment then along with that you can put some comments in between like uh, the any document or reader you can see some similar functionalities are available so similarly you can do the same same activities here you can highlight some of the elements so whatever you do that will be updated and that will be reflected in the entire document so that is uh, one advantage of having this kind of tool that is it is beyond the functionalities of a traditional digital library then the second one uh, if you look at the document there is a, you can see an option on a sync uh, so synchronize will automatically synchronize the content with the cloud environment so that whatever you update here that will be available in, in a cloud environment so that uh, if you are making your own machine in your lab so all the documents will be automatically updated and uh, you can have a synchronized information that is connected to the cloud and uh, you can keep same data in multi devices so that is uh, one uh, side of the mendeley then the other requirement of mendeley is uh, which is related to the citation that is reference management that is after performing the so-called uh, literature survey, you will be developing some content based on the studies which you have conducted. So when you are going for the uh, uh, development of the content, then the next question is whenever there is a possibility, we must cite it. That is the practice or that is the ethical way to do uh, uh, publication. So here we have got uh, this uh, tool also have got some kind of plugins. Right now the plugins are supported only for two uh, applications. One is LibreOffice and the other one is for the web. So using these two applications, uh, you can import, directly import uh, the reference uh, information to the document. So I'll uh, show you how to update that information right now. So here I'm going to use uh, Microsoft Bait. So using Bait, uh, once you install your uh, uh, plugin for Microsoft Bait, you can find there is a, an additional plugin. That plugin is something like mentally plugin. And uh, using this plugin, uh, you can uh, automatically insert the necessary reference uh, or citation information. Like uh, here, I'm going to type something like a virtual machines are uh, uh, text uh, updated. And I just want to put the citation. So I can use the insert citation value here. So I can put the value something like BNU and I can refer it. And uh, if I'm having one more reference to be added, I can use something else, then uh, put it like that. So right now it is updating, the reference values are being updated. You can see that one, two references, uh, that is uh, based on the reference information which I have provided. And uh, after uh, drafting your document, you can put the insert, uh, you can update, uh, insert uh, bibliographic information. So that will help us to automatically generate the uh, reference information or bibliographic information. So right now it is following the IEEE standard and if you are going for multi-standard or different standard, you can refer that standard. And uh, right now we have got a limited number of standards uh, that, that's downloaded in my uh, device. So you can look for the uh, options, uh, like uh, different uh, uh, templates are available. You can download it from the mainly, uh, main web website. You can see how it looks uh, uh, when you modify the citation. Like uh, for the American something, uh, that journal the citation is something like this one and you can see that how the citation modified the reference values so that is uh, one side of the mainly that is one advantage of the mainly Okay, so next one. So next one, uh, the features associated with Mindly is like, uh, which is related to web importer. Like uh, whenever you include that web importer to the, uh, to your browser, uh, that is depending on the browser. Then once you modified or installed your browser and given the necessary permissions, whenever you access a document, 
immediately you can see that there is a pop up uh, menu will be uh, opened up and you can see that uh, they, it will prompt for whether to ask it to uh, something like a, uh, it will help you to include it in your uh, repository so even without manual downloads etc it will be automatically included into the repository that is one uh, advantage of uh, having this one that is instead of going for manually downloading the document and uh, in, in integrating into the mentally desktop you can try for this option uh, web importer option using that option you can get it from the uh, website directly that is uh, one uh, one side of one uh, advantage of uh, medley so here let me check whether it is available right now so if I am accessing a particular document, I'll be able to see that uh, there is a mainly desktop uh, or mainly uh, plugin will be activated and I can include those details into my mainly desktop. So that is uh, a generic overview of mainly. So mainly will do so many tasks as I mentioned. Then the next one, uh, next one like um, this is a reference management that is uh, using weight plugin or uh, LibreOffice, you can directly include the reference management information. That is one uh, one aspect. That is, imagine that you are not using Word or uh, LibreOffice to develop your document. Maybe you are using LaTeX uh, internal editor or your desktop editor, or maybe you are using some other editors to include the reference information. So how exactly you can uh, cite all those information, how you can perform this reference management. So mainly also supports uh, exporting of uh, reference management inform reference information by selecting a number of references which you identify which is useful and uh, using the export option using the ex export option you can export the information or the reference managing information so we know that uh, the uh, type of that category that is it is known as bib text or bibliographic information that is a standard followed so using that method, you can export, that is all the documents, all the information, which is relevant for your document writing or document development. And this information may be later used in another service like a content development service. And you can directly make use of this particular web text, uh, web text information. So that means mainly is uh, a kind of personal digital assistant. It supports uh, so many things which will be helpful for your uh, research career. So that is uh, all about mainly. So then next comes after literature, uh, the so-called literature or something like a management literature survey and the document archiving, etc. The next question comes in our mind is how to develop the content. So one option is you can uh, straight away go for the Word application or you can go for LibreOffice or there are number of applications are available. And uh, one another option is to maintain the uh, te uh, template uh, intact without any changes. The best available option is LaTeX. But LaTeX having some difficulty, like uh, if you do it in your desktop, you need to ensure that uh, all the libraries, all the supporting files, supporting packages to be configured manually. If something missing, you have to do manual in download, etc. So even though you install MyTex and uh, similar stuff applications, still uh, you will be finding some difficulty in uh, deploying all these applications. So what next? What is the best available option to reduce their complexity? That is, I just want to have uh, the functionality without any uh, efforts uh, in terms of identifying the package and uh, importing the package, downloading the package, integrating with my application. So I'm not uh, not at all interested to uh, coordinate or, uh, of, uh, I mean, uh, settle all those issues. That is part of uh, that is, that is a technical kind of errors and uh, we just need to concentrate more on the development so the best uh, available option when you go for that thing is uh, you can try overleaf you can try overleaf and overleaf uh, is uh, something like uh, it is not uh, it is a semi uh, free or semi uh, paid type of uh, applications like um, uh, for independent or individual users uh, you can find almost all features are free but uh, for the projects something like um, uh, like uh, if you are having a lab if you are running a lab and you are trying to have multiple users and uh, etc then it is uh, paid it is an it is a paid application okay so that is one side uh, so like uh, if i am looking for a document and document must be shared and uh, we 
and uh, multiple users having the permission to access the same document, then uh, it must be uh, they will be charging a small amount. But otherwise, if I'm going for the independent or kind of independent application, you can go for a free account uh, with uh, some uh, cloud storage area. So uh, right now, uh, if I'm going for something like a new document, you can try the new document like uh, I can uh, already have a number of uh, templates available so I can go for the academic journal then if I'm selecting the academic journal it will list out uh, most commonly used academic journals most of the journal uh, templates are available you may select any of this journal you may select any of this journal then uh, this journal can be uh, or this uh, template can be open up uh, open as template and then uh, once it is opened uh, you will be getting the environment to and uh, update your en uh, entries you can see that uh, it is nothing but it's basically uh, the so-called desktop editor itself so whatever you need to update you need to manually update things uh, within the given tags uh, latex tags but the thing is that when you go for the compilation process, you don't have to worry about the difficulty which is related to uh, compilation errors, etc. So at a single shot, you, uh, whatever you do uh, that is available at uh, the destination site, uh, you can convert your document without any uh, worries. That is uh, one type of application you can try out uh, like Overleaf. And uh, you, uh, you can even try, uh, you can develop your own class files and uh, template files, et cetera, with this uh, document, or with this tool. So that is uh, open project, uh, op not open project, it is uh, Overleaf. Then Overleaf is commonly used for uh, developing content, like uh, latter content, we may use this uh, tool and it supports a number of templates and using that template, uh, you can update things. So now the question comes in, like right now I'm going for uh, IEEE submission, okay, document prepared for the IEEE submission. Later, that is, uh, unfortunately, that is rejected by that particular conference or journal. Later, I just want to submit it to some other journal or some other publication. So suddenly there is a uh, change in the template. So we need to update things manually, right? So how to overcome that one? That is, uh, already you have updated so many things. Of course, uh, some of the common template uh, parameters are common, but things that uh, there is a class file, you have to update the class file, then based on that, you need to recompile. So again, it is a time consuming one. That is uh, already you have prepared and it, you have to uh, migrate this document to another template. So that uh, instead of going for that one, which is the best available option. So how to reduce the overall uh, uh, overall development time in terms of the, in terms based on the template uh, or switching between the template or migrating from one template to another template so here i am going to introduce another tool another tool that tool basically not a proprietary uh, not a free tool something like overleaf it is a proprietary tool but it is very effective in that sense like uh, uh, you you are free from the template uh, concept okay you can update anything and depending on the template, you can switch from one document to another document. So here I'm going to introduce the tool, which is known as uh, Typeset IO. This, this is an AI driven tool. Using this AI driven tool, you can go for, uh, it is uh, something similar to uh, the traditional word editor or something like that. Uh, it's like uh, it gives you a kind of uh, an area where you can put your information, like your input information, something like an introduction track, or depending on the template, you can put any information here. And automatically it generates information. So like here I am going for a new document. I can try for a new document, uh, so I can take it from the template. So already there are a number of templates are there. I can go for IEEE access. So I'm selecting IEEE access. So I got the template for IEEE access. 
So I'm going to use that template, a blank document. So my settings are, my environment will be updated immediately after importing that template. So right now, uh, the template having basic information, right now, as per the basic information we are expecting, like uh, you can, you have the option to provide the title. I can provide the title, so that will be updated here. You can see that that information will be updated here. Yeah, that is updated. And I can put my other information. So all the necessary information I can update here. So that will be updated. So all those details, which is relevant for the document that can be updated. Uh, then I can put the keyword information also that will be updated uh, uh, in the final document. Then uh, I just want to put an update abstract information, a brief idea about something. So that is the content which I have type updated. So it is uh, compiling and uh, it will generate the document or the document with the abstract information. So it simply updates all those details. So you need to, you, you don't have to worry about anything related to uh, the so-called uh, uh, the templates and the making the template uh, uh, structure extra in, within the given limit, or you don't have to worry about the overall look and feel of the document. You just need to update things as uh, similar to updating the contents in a notepad editor, then uh, the system will help us to uh, convert it into the document expected. Then I just want to put my uh, references. I just want to put my references. For that, uh, you can try out uh, these options uh, so using the insert option. There are a number of options to include so many details, equation, uh, then footnote, uh, table, figures, et cetera. Then for using this option, I can include the references. So uh, this one, like you have, you are maintaining your entire literature survey document in one other, on another application. Maybe uh, right now we are using mentally and uh, sometimes you may be using uh, Sotero, otherwise you may be using N0. So depending on the application, all the applications having an option to extract the reference management information, like the text format information. So you can include that information, like uh, I can put the site information, I can import the, that information, like you can see that mainly sort of sort of import, I can download or import the already saved document, that is you can see the document which I have already updated, I can open it. It doesn't have anything. Try the other one, previous one. Okay. Nothing working. Okay, I think uh, contents are missing in that file. So if you have the content, proper content, uh, you just need to update things. Uh, like uh, if we check whether it's available or not.
and paste it. So idea is nothing but uh, you are importing uh, all the reference information uh, you uh, with uh, that is all you by selecting the number of references you can export the reference information and uh, you just include uh, that reference in, reference information to the application then wherever there is a a point to cite you just put the information like uh, you may select uh, something like this one so as per the IEEE standard it will be updated and uh, you can see that the, all the information will be updated like that. So you can see the information will be updated something like that. And finally, you can uh, put the information something like uh, update. So your content will be generated and along with that, the reference information will be generated. Why it is getting the wrong references? Because uh, the document which is uh, included, it won't be having the correct reference structure. That's why it is giving uh, information like that. Uh, because we have simply copied the information to the given text box. That's why it is generating the error. If, if it is following the correct text format, you won't be having any issues. So you'll be getting the structure in the proper order. So that is, uh, uh types it so it is an ai driven uh, application that application will help us to uh, develop the document without any worries and uh, if you're having this application uh, with the license it also having an option to uh, check your uh, content uh, in terms of uh, plagiarism that is we you may verify the plagiarism uh, levels of your document so here uh, there is an option to plagiarism and uh, the interesting thing is that it is using Tenetin, the, the one of the best application for checking the plagiarism. So you can uh, try for that one that is uh, part of this particular application like uh, typeset IO uh, that includes uh, the plagiarism checking interface. So whatever be the document which you created that can be used for that can be extended for plagiarism check in between. So it depends like uh, if you have a lab license uh, you'll be uh, having uh, un unlimited uh, plagiarism check right now i have some limitations limitation sense uh, i i am permitted to do only two checks per month so it is uh, depending on the license you have you have you, for the lab license you will be having multiple multi uh, access license uh, right now i have a limitation that's it so that is uh, a generic idea about uh, typeset so right now we discussed about two two applications uh, for document development. Uh, one is uh, uh, Overleaf and second one is mainly, uh, second one is Typeset. So whichever be the application, it has its own advantage, its own, its own limitations. But things uh, seems like uh, Typeset is a kind of application which is uh, in terms of the development of the content uh, with the help of the predefined uh, template it is uh, here it is somewhat easy like uh, switching between one template to another template is also very easy in this context and uh, you have an option to plagiarism check uh, even though it is limited there is an option to uh, perform your plagiarism check here so that is uh, document development uh, two different tools which is related to document development the next one, which I am going to discuss about uh, how to develop uh, something like an image, like the uh, figures are conveying more content than any text you have written. So always we prefer to have our document will be our always trying to maintain a, a, a kind of uh, information or we just want to convey the, all those information with the help of some figures. So advantage of figures means it conveys information very easily. And at the same time, if you have a, a good diagrams and good pictures mentioned in the document, that will improve the overall citation. That is always if you, most of the people will try to uh, extract the given uh, figure information for their own publication. So automatically, even though without uh, any difficulty, the citation uh, of your document may increase based on the quality of figure you put in. So how to update this thing? So all Daya is one application, freeware application where you can try. 
but they are having some limitation in the sense uh, it is a, a kind of a monochrome type of development or the diagram diagrammatic tool uh, here right now most of the application right now uh, looking for uh, something like a colorful type of images where you can have the integrated icons uh, corresponding to the field that will give a cool uh, looks and feel about that particular content which you are pl planning to convey so for that you may make use of another tool that is known as Creately. So you, you can see a similar kind of an application, a number of applications related to uh, the, it is ending with Lee, Dootly, Googly, then uh, Creately, then uh, Toons, Toonly, a number of applications are there. So all these applications are in, in one, one aspect or other aspect, it is related to diagrams or uh, animations. So right now, this application, that application is related to developing the content, uh, that content uh, in terms of the image content. Bino, so, uh, I would request, sorry, sorry, uh, Professor uh, Bino, I would request you yeah. to wind up early. Yeah? Okay, okay. So uh -huh. one minute, two to three minutes. Yeah. So this uh, application will help us to uh, develop the content uh, in a post, in a more attractive way, like uh, it has got almost all features, like almost iconic uh, options. You can simply drag and drop, and uh, finally, after developing the entire document, you can share or you can export it in a uh, high resolution format, like you can see PNG, SVG, or any other formats. So uh, this is uh, one uh, application where you can try. This application will help us to improve the quality of the picture. This uh, application will help us to improve the visibility of your article, etc. So already uh, we have uh, discussed uh, a number of tools, like uh, starting off with us mainly, then uh, we discussed about uh, uh, the open uh, overleaf, uh, then uh, uh, typeset IO, and finally Creately. All these uh, tools will help you to improve the content archival and content development. And that of course will improve, uh, that will reduce the total time to uh, develop the entire content. Like the primary objective uh, is for improving the overall quality of time that is how effectively you are making use of the time so for in that sense all these applications are very useful uh, with this i just wind up if you have any queries you may uh, post it and uh, i am extending a uh, heartfelt uh, gratitude to the entire organization to uh, for the invitation and giving a chance to present uh, my concept uh, or interact uh, for interacting with you about the tools and technologies which i am right now using Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Registry Ma'am. Over to you, Ma'am. Thank you so much, sir. The session was very enlightening. The session for question and answer is open now. We request you all to kindly post your doubts on the chat window. Uh, Sweetma, I think in the interest of time, we will uh, request the uh, questions on the chat window and we will take them offline and we can now start with the next proceeding. Yes, ma'am. Uh, before that, on behalf of Team Education 4.0, we would like to present you with a virtual memento as a token of our gratitude. We request you to kindly accept, sir. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. As our next, next guest speaker, we have with us Ms. Lorena Garcia to deliver her session on IEEE Tri Engineering. Lorena Garcia, ma'am, is the Director of Laboratories and Infrastructure at Universidad Central Colombia. Ms. Lorena is also the IEEE EAB Pre-University Education Coordinating Committee Chair. We welcome you, ma'am, and request you to kindly address the gathering. Hello, everybody, and thanks for, for the invitation. I'm very honored to be uh, today with you. Um, welcome, Lorena. <laughs> <laughs> as, as it was mentioned, I want uh, today to um, share with you uh, some information about the resources that Educational Activities has uh, regarding the pre-university education STEM activities. Um, let me share my screen. 
Give me a moment, please. Okay. Well, I, I know that uh, yesterday you uh, received a talk from Professor Supavadi Arambit about the general resources that uh, a Tripoli Education Activities Board offers. Uh, but today I'm going to uh, go deeper uh, around training engineering, which is uh, the brand that we manage uh, around all the programs that we have, specifically on the pre university STEM uh, activities. So as it was mentioned, while well, this is me, I've been um, a volunteer of IEEE for 18 years now. This is my sixth year as a member of the Educational Activities Board. I'm in my, my second year chairing the Pre-University Education uh, Coordinating Committee. Well, what is this all about? We all know that um, the technology is the result of people, that we, are in a lack of um, technical workforce, and this will continue increasing in the in the coming years. So, what one that what IEEE wants is to build a, that future talent pool. That's why IEEE invests in STEM education. We want to encourage and um, the the youth to see themselves as someone who can improve the world through STEM careers. So that's why we always think in sharing, giving back, and inspiring as a way of um, promoting the STEM professionals, the STEM activities uh, with uh, students and also with teachers, uh, with educators that are in, 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 in the classroom. And of course, our volunteers are also doing a great job uh, helping us to, to, to reach more students and educators. Well, the mission of the Pre-University Education Coordinating Committee is to promote and enhance the level of technological literacy of pre-university educators and students. Um, so we have a set of resources, um, mainly in our webpage, trainingengineering.org. We have some um, resources related to curriculum, pedagog pedagogical practices that are open to pre-university educators and volunteers. So then, they can help us to encourage students to aspire to related careers related to, uh, to the IEEE fields of interest. So what's around the train engineering brand? We have, um, right now we have three, three main programs. Uh, one is traingineering.org, I will, I will um, go deeper with that later. Uh, and we have the train engineering summer institute. This is a two week summer college experience with summer college experience for eighth to twelfth grade students. So it's uh, we are partnering with um, right now with four universities in United States. Um, so where where students can go and experience a two week camp all around um, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, that, that will be a very interesting program. It started like uh, four years ago, but unfortunately, because of the COVID pandemic, um, we were not able to, to do it on last year, nor, nor this one. Uh, but we hope, we really hope to continue with this program uh, during the 20, 2022 summer. Uh, and we're also looking for opportunities to take this program outside the United States. And, and we're making some, some progress with that. We also have Train Engineering Together. This is also a program that right now is, is only working on, on the United States. Um, this is a, a, an online platform where uh, teachers and, their, and, and, and his or her classroom um, in grades from third to fifth can uh, be mentored by people uh, from industry. There is a correspondence, le there, there are correspondence uh, letters between uh, students and mentors from industry uh, related to some topics that the teachers can, can guide. This is a very interesting um, program. We have right now more like more than 800 students uh, involved with this program. And I'm going to go deeper with trainingengineering.org. If you don't know it, I invite you to go to the webpage. Um, this, this portal was launched in 2006, 
uh, as our pre-university education, engineering education web portal. We have here resources for educators to assist them in bringing engineering and technology in their classrooms and providing students with resources to prepare them to, for STEM careers. What can we find here? As you can see, there are three uh, different sessions. Uh, first one is for teachers. Here you can find, uh, for example, our lesson plans. We have more than 130 lesson plans. They can be translated to any language using the, the, the Google automatic translation tool. The, the, the form that the lesson plans are displayed on the web page are suitable for, for using Google Translate very easily. Um, and some uh, and additional resources for, for teachers. We also have the section for students where they can find information about the different STEM fields. Like for, for example, what is the difference between an aerospace engineering with an oceanic engineering or a computer engineering, et cetera. Um, there's a section also for meeting an engineer. We have some profiles of, of well-known, recognized engineers, IEEE members. We have games, we have information about uh, where to find a university. And uh, of course, even for parents, um, some resources about virtual learning. Um, of course, uh, with this um, COVID-19 situation, the, the virtual learning has gained uh, um, importance in, in during these days. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of things that you can explore here. Um, as you as um, in the different in the different oh and of course we have resources for volunteers I will uh, talk about that later. Uh, last year we also launched the volunteer lesson plan toolkit. Um, this is um, um we selected fifteen of our most downloaded lesson plans, the most popular ones, and we added an overview video on how to implement that lesson plans. We also um, added a, a video for each of these lesson plans and a PowerPoint slide deck that the teacher can just download it or the volunteer just can download it and use it in the classroom for presenting the activity. All the information is there. Um, and we also added a, a video about giving an overview of the engineering design, design processes like um, giving more content for that the lesson plans can be um, easy, easily um, organized. I can, um, I will try to, to show you a little bit. This is the, the, the plan toolkit, as you, as you can see. There's, this is the, 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 an overview of the training engineering lesson plans. Um, and for each lesson plan, you will find the PowerPoint ready. For example, let's take this um, this lesson plan, ship the chip. Um, here you will find the complete lesson plan. You can the lesson plan has all the information that you need to um, for being applied in, in in the classroom or, or, or when a volunteer is doing. A, is an STEM activity with some students in a school. Um, so here is the video where easily it's explained how to how to do it. And you have all the information here, the materials that you need, how to uh, how to test it, uh, some real world applications about this. Um, there's information about uh, the engineering design challenge and um, the activity instructions. This is very, very clear for for the teachers. Um, there's also a student worksheet that you can easily download. Uh, the lesson plan can also be downloaded in, 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 in PDF. And, um, you know, more, more information about um, the careers that are related to, to this specific lesson plan. And um, so it, and it's the same for all of the 15. Besides this, there's, there are the complete list of lesson plans. You can find them um or you can use this this uh, search tool and you can find the, based on the category or all the ages that you want to 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 reach 
Uh, there are lesson plans intended for, for young kids from five, from five to seven years old until lesson plans uh, to, to older kids from eight, 14 to 18 years old. So uh, this, th these are very, those are very interesting sources that you can explore. They are open. Uh, you, just can, you just need to go to the training.org and start exploring them. Um, sorry. Well, um, we have also started a new initiative this year that we call Train Engineering Tuesday. This is a, a program that in, we're in partnership with IEEE Technical Societies. Um, what is this is that we, we have created um, like a blog where we have a, a student guide in four steps, explore, discover, inspire, and share um, in a specific topic that the society are offering us. We, so far, we have worked with the Oceanic Engineering Society, Computer Society, Aerospace and Electronic Systems Society, Photonic Society, this week we launched um, a training in Tuesday about electrical vehicles with the um, um, electrification transportation community, the, one of the IEEE technical communities. And in the upcoming months, we will be working with Power and Energy Society. Um, and in four months, we, each month we are going to have a different topic about renewable energies, smart grids, etc. Um, and the, the nice thing is that um, that teachers can um, or the students can earn some badges and, and the idea is that they can collect them all. Um, it's a very easy to use um, resource, as, as I said, of course, all volunteers or even parents with their, with their kids at home can, can use this information. For example, if I go here, um, about the, the last one, the, the recent one that is the, about the electrical vehicles, you are going to see some activities or information. Well, here is information for exploring the topic. Um, there are um, games or, or a lot of resources related to this topic. And we also have each month a webinar where uh, experts on this topic explain what they are doing um, about, for example, in this case, electrical vehicles uh, in a very um, easy way to understand, intended for uh, students. Okay, and well, um, we're working now also with the IEEE Volunteer STEM portal. This was launched on January 21st. Why? Because we realized that there are many volunteer-led pre-university STEM activities happening globally. Um, we know that our volunteers are very interested in supporting young students and encourage them to, to, to follow these uh, STEM careers. So, but we, we didn't have a way for collecting that information, uh, for knowing what they were doing, and that we know that having that information we can inspire other volunteers to continue in this in in this type of activities so we created um the volunteer stem portal as a resource that employs the power of IEEE volunteer expertise experience and range to drive stem outreach so any technical society or council or chapter the sections affinity groups the the HKN chapters, student chapter, student branches, sorry. Um, we know that all of them in, 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 there are very great programs around the STEM. So we want to collect all the information and of course, help them to leverage their programs. So the STEM portal at the end is a searchable, searchable library of current STEM and pre-university programs. These programs are developed by IEEE uh, volunteers. Um, so if you are running a program related to STEM, please consider submitting it to the, to the, to the portal. Um, so uh, other volunteers around the world will know about what you're doing and will be inspired for probably replicating them or, or, or yeah, being inspired for continuing in this path too. Um, we also have resources to, to several resources to support uh, current or new STEM programs. 
we are collecting some metrics. We have um, added two V tools for IT Poly volunteers. V tools is the um, the tool that we use for reporting to IT Poly events. What uh, that we do, even technical or um, or social or or humanitarian, and now we can uh, report pre-university activities. Um, during this year, we have seen more than seventy more than more than seventy uh, events reported in in pre-university um, related to pre-university activities, uh, and with and and. With that, we have seen that so far we have impacted more than 6,000 students with almost 1,000 volunteers involved. That's a huge amount of activities. Uh, so we really want to know what is happening. And, and that's, that, that is our opportunity to, to know about that. Um, we also have created uh, an ambassador program. We have launched uh, at the beginning of this month. Uh, this is a call for recognizing uh, all the volunteers that have been involved um, in, in STEM outreach activities uh, for the last uh, years. Um, and we will call it IEEE STEM ambassadors. Uh, and with that, we, we, are, we, we, want, we want to give them some benefits or some uh, support their efforts in, 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 this, in, this, uh, in this field. Uh, and we also, I'm sorry, I, I didn't update this. We we had a, um, a STEM grant program. It was um, it was open until July 1st, and yesterday we announced the the recipients. We are going. We allocated three uh, thirty five thousand dollars, and we are going to support eighteen programs uh, with almost uh, all of them with two thousand dollars each of them um so we're very excited that, that these are from 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 uh, different regions in in IEEE, especially those outside united states region seven to ten um so we're very excited they are they are going to implement uh, their programs during the rest of the year so at, at the end we are going to see the results of of a uh, of what they did during in, in these months, uh, we are sure that they are going to impact probably more than 1,000 um, students in total. Also, educators and parents. So that's that's very important for us. Uh, and at the end, we want to uh, engage our volunteers um, with the ability to share their programs. Um, they also can find a program to host or organize. Uh, if you see some something that you are interested in, or oh, this is a, a really good program and it, and is being organized in my in near by me, uh, so I can I can um, ask the organizers and 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 offer me as a volunteer, for example. You can learn best practices, and we also have we're building our STEM community. Um, we are we are doing we are planning several things around this. For example, we are going to have the first IEEE STEM summit during the first week of November. Uh, we are still on 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 the planning stage, but we we hope to to launch it uh, very soon. So uh, I I invite you all to participate. Uh, this will be a, an open and um, virtual event, um, and for. During one week, we are going to present a, we, several topics ab around STEM uh, and the ideas, of course, to help to impact as many students as possible. Uh, so, well, as I said, well, our mission is to provide opportunities and resources for volunteer generated STEM activities to impact as many students as possible with the vision that the youth will see themselves as someone who can improve the world through, the, through engineering and technology. Um, so this is here is the, the the STEM portal. You can access using this um, website STEM um, this link STEM portal uh, trainengineering.org or as I said using just trainengineering.org and and selecting the the volunteers part. 
And so we have nine categories. Our programs are in nine. And these programs can be camps or competitions or fairs. And we have a specific session about the girls in STEM because we know that um, that is a we we are an underrepresented population in STEM, unfortunately. So that um, our volunteers really want to focus on attracting more, more girls to STEM fields. Uh, programs about mentoring and student workshops, or could be teacher workshops, or industry or company tours, career day, or parent programs. In each of these categories, you can go there, for example, let's say competitions, and you will find the programs that, that are being um, organized by our volunteers. Uh, for example, RoboFest, or this is from Region 10, probably you, you have heard um, about, about this, this uh, event. Um, Etc. So, and for each of them, for example, let's go here. You will find the information, the general information about the program, who is organizing it, and who to contact uh, if you are interested in, in having more details. The description, some some details about the the program, and what we call it the implementation guide. That is more uh, more information about what they needed to implement uh, this program, logistic outreach, um, and of course, um, any attachment that the volunteer uh, want to add, wants to add, the promotional pieces or some photos or, or the agenda, things like that. So you can explore here all of the programs. And the other thing that we have in the STEM portal is um, this map. If you're organizing an event, um, uh, about the STEM outreach, you can go to the tools um, reported there, and we will have the we will have this, the information posted here in our web page, so everybody will know about what your uh, about your events. So, for example, right now there are two upcoming events, uh, one in Nigeria and one in Egypt. Um, so you can you can always see here what is what is um, happening. Um, what are the programs that are being organized or the events that are being organized by the volunteers? If you want to know more about the ambassador programs, you can you can go here. As I said, the, this this call is open until August 20, so it's still time for applying. And um, if you want to, you can submit your program here and share your program. I'll provide your results when you after you complete your event. You can go here. You can come here and 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 provide your results. And well, that here is the information about the grant program that I already mentioned. And we also have this um, section about resources. Uh, you will find here in different categories why STEM outreach, about diversity, of uh, about fundraising, about of course the lesson and activities or STEM for good. So um, you can select any of these categories, and you will find a set of, of resources. Uh, that, that you can use uh, in, in that topic. So, um, what is our ambition future? We want to see this map that I, that I already showed you, um, full of uh, events. We really want to encourage more volunteers to, to do STEM outreach activities. Um, so, we together can impact as many students as possible with hundreds of, of 10 activities offered each year. Um, there are some ways that you can participate with us. For example, join our communities. We have a pre-university collaborative community um, and we have a train engineering community in, on Facebook. You can go and, and join to, to receive the, the, the information firsthand. And of course, if you want to share your career profile or you want to suggest um, hands on activities that can be that can become on um, into lesson plans, or if you're creating games or any other resource that you have and that you would like to, to share with the rest of the community, uh, here are the contacts that you can use. Um, as I said, I am the chair of the committee, but my, my colleagues Donna Schultz and Bordich, they are the staff that manage um, is from the IEEE side. So, share, give back, inspired, working together to impact as many students as possible. 
I hope that that I can motivate you to 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 continue in this in this field. And while I'm open to to any question. The session for question and answer is open now. Request you all to kindly post your doubts on the chat window. Great presentation, Lorena. Thank you so much for accepting. Thanks to you for inviting me. It's, it's very important for me to, to tell you about all of this information. Absolutely, very useful. So yesterday only we received a message from you only to our section, Professor G.S. Mani. He has received funds for one of our programs. Oh, yes, that's great. Congratulations. I'm sure it will be a great program. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, it's almost now, uh, this is fourth edition. Last four years we are doing it. So we have Excellent. reached so many. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for being Hi, here. Hi, And hey, you have Radnik here. Uh, Radnik is Radnik one of the members of the Volunteer yes. Engagement Working Group. We have been working very hard on of creating more resources and more ways for encouraging and motivating and supporting volunteers who are doing STEM outreach activities. So uh, Radnik is, is, is our main contact here. Um, so yes, thank yes. you, Radnik, again. Absolutely. And it is only because of him we could connect to you and then you are here today with us. Thank you, Radnik, for that. Yes. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your insightful session on dry engineering. On behalf of Team Education 4.0, we would like to present you with a virtual memento as a token of our gratitude. We request you to kindly accept, ma'am. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for joining us today. Have a good rest of the, of the event. Bye-bye. As our next guest speaker, we have Mr. John Day amongst us to speak on IEEE Collaborative, uniting the IEEE global technical community. Mr. Day is an IEEE senior member serving as the director of member products and programs in support of the mission and goals of IEEE members and geographic activities. I would like to extend your warm welcome, sir, and request you to kindly deliver your session. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I uh, sincerely appreciate the invitation to be here with you today, coming to you from the United States. And I would like to thank Lorena as well for uh, kindly uh, resequencing today's talks. My name is John Day, and uh, I have been involved with the IEEE for quite some time, and uh, yeah. after about 20 years. And uh, I have had the great fortune of coming to India and engaging with many of our members uh, and volunteers in India. So it is indeed a pleasure to come back and spend some time with you today to talk about a uh, very big initiative that's been underway now for several years. And uh, really pleased to tell you how that has uh, impacted our relationship with each other, as well as bringing great value to our members. So I will uh, share my slide. And bring it up here. And if I could just have a confirmation that uh, you have a visual. Yes, yes, it is visible. Excellent. Okay. Next question is making it full screen here. Okay. Today, I'm going to uh, present on a uh, topic called IEEE Collaboratech. And for uh, many of you on the call, uh, you may be familiar with the platform. And for those who aren't, I'm happy to walk you through some of the basics on how to use the platform. Uh, today will be a very quick overview because there are so many details about the platform uh, that um, we could spend easily an hour on any one of the, uh, any one of the features. Uh, do know in advance that we have a great support team so that if anybody on the call would like to have more information uh, about Collaboratech, we will gladly uh, schedule follow-up sessions with you. Where I'm going to start today is speaking a little bit about the IEEE. Uh, the IEEE is a very large organization and it has many different uh, connections and organizations 
uh, throughout the world. And this is just one uh, look at the size of the organization. Uh, we have what we call 425 sections and subsections, and that's basically geographic uh, borders around the world. We have student branches around the world as well, 3,500 of those. 39 technical societies, which uh, cover all different types of uh, technical domains and disciplines. Extensions of those societies uh, geographically called technical chapters, and then certainly affinity groups that represent our local presence for great programs like the Women in Engineering and Young Professionals program. So, as you can see, we are a very networked organization. And um, often uh, it's been my experience that, uh, especially in speaking with students, they think about IEEE, and often there's a reputation of IEEE as being a local club at the university. Well, in fact, it's a global organization with, uh, as I mentioned, 3,500 student branches around the world. So this is an extensive network. Uh, and, and this network really is here for you to benefit you uh, as you pursue your uh, career, as you uh, advance your research, that the knowledge that we collectively have around the organization is really a great asset. Despite how large the organization is, and it is very large, at its core, the value of IEEE is about its people and uh, their collective collaborations. Uh, as Lorena rightfully mentioned before with the, with the uh, tri-engineering program, you know, the, the collective activities of education around STEM is very important to IEEE and it's also very important to our mission. And, and those great collaborations take place because we have passionate volunteers and members who uh, who really believe in the importance of STEM education, and they come together and form these great collaborations and hold these great events around the world. So, you know, we can talk about how big the organization is, but ultimately it really uh, boils down to we as individuals and our ability to find others that share our interests. And then uh, once we find those individuals, how do we make something happen? Uh, for the betterment of our local student branch, perhaps our section, or even a larger cause for the mission of the organization. So back in uh, about seven years ago, uh, the IEEE really challenged us. The board of directors challenged us as an organization. Even though we have all these different parts of the organization around the world, how can we bring this together? How can we bring this entire network together so that we can easily find each other? Uh, we can discover the interests of our fellow members and uh, fellow, fellow colleagues. And how can we jumpstart and spark collaborations that uh, were never available before or possible before because of the distance of geography? And so we embarked upon this great journey to build this platform that is essentially would bring together this global technical community and make it accessible from one platform, uh, regardless of where one lived, regardless of their membership grade, and also regardless of their IEEE membership status. And that's one thing I want to call to the attention of everyone today is IEEE Collaboratech is open. It's an open platform. And uh, one does not need to be an IEEE member to sign up to Collaboratech. So if uh, you, for example, at your student branch have colleagues or students who don't belong to IEEE, they're more than welcome to sign up to Collaboratech. There's no cost to them. And they're welcome to join our community to get a better feel for what it's about and explore the many opportunities that IEEE provides. Now, that being said, um, our IEEE members have a very premium experience on the platform, and I will, I will spend some attention to that uh, as we proceed. So we have a platform that's open to non-members, and the same platform provides a premium experience uh, to our IEEE members. So to that end, I just would like to call to your attention that when you log into the platform, you will see what we call the uh, console to the left. And uh, we have a member console that just rolled out earlier this year that brings together the various uh, premium services that are available to IEEE members. Uh, one click access will uh, uh, bring you to your membership certificate. Uh, it will also uh, give you access to the IEEE membership directory. What we call section and student branch gateways that started rolling out last year. Uh, we have a wonderful directory of IEEE mentors. 
some career services, as well as some of our great content from iTruly Spectrum and iTruly TV. So this is all now located in one convenient location on the platform for iTruly members. And if you happen to be a non-member, you'll still have a console. It's just that the members only features will be grayed out. So we're trying to bring this together in a very efficient uh, experience for our members, as well as the larger profession. Every member, every user of the platform can personalize their, their experience. They can create their professional identity. And what's unique about Collaboratech and establishing the professional identity is it's really geared toward techies and engineers. So that we're, we're establishing a presence that's within a niche community among fellow engineers and techies. And what we have found is this creates uh, more rich opportunities for collaborations because we can more quickly find people who share our technical and our engineering interests and then uh, take that to the next level, whether we decide to, to connect with them or create a workspace for collaboration. So the one-stop place where you personalize your experience is under the account preferences, and you can see some of the options that are listed there. Choose an interest is very important, and again, just to reinforce, this is a, this is a really niche community around techies and engineers, so you can see that the interests are geared toward our profession. Uh, and we can really drill down on topics such as data acquisition. It could be uh, uh, anything from smart grids or uh, even nanotechnology. And what this allows, allows us to do is to start personalizing the experience so that we can put actually opportunities in front of you that are much more aligned to your interests. Back to that original slide, as I noticed, iTruly is a very big organization. It has many different technical domains. So often the biggest challenge in getting the most out of IEEE is, is to discover these different opportunities that are relevant to the individual techie or engineer. So assigning interests is very important to that because it helps uh, wade through the large organization to really just focus on the people, the opportunities, and the content that's relevant for you. I mentioned before the IEEE membership directory, and this is a fascinating and fantastic resource for all of you. You know, all collaborations begin through connections and connections of shared interests. And what we have done is we've brought together all of those various networks into a very convenient uh, people directory. And as you can see here, we break it down uh, between IEEE members, our mentors, our volunteers, and authors around the world. So we're, we're really trying to bring the full scope of the network all together and at the same time provide our users the ability to filter according to perhaps their membership status, their membership affiliations, uh, student branch affiliation, as well as interest countries, so that the individual user of the platform can come in and very quickly find individuals that relate to their interests, but at the same time, individuals who are not necessarily from their local student branch or the local section. With this uh, membership directory, you can look across the entire world for actually members who share your interests so that we can spark new types of collaborations worldwide. What we've also found out uh, is that if you should pursue the opportunity of becoming an actually senior member as you advance in your career, it's a great resource for finding other senior members, which is a requirement for submitting your senior member application. You need to have references from other senior members. So what we find is those members who are pursuing that opportunity often go to Collaboratech to locate other senior members, either within their section uh, or abroad, to help them with their application. You know, workspaces are an incredible opportunity to uh, bring together a few individuals who have a shared interest and a shared passion, and they're very easy to create. Any user of the platform can create a workspace. Uh, it takes about three minutes to do it, and uh, each workspace offers uh, threaded discussions, a very robust file and folder management system, uh, an enhanced project tracker, which allows uh, individuals within the workspace to track their various projects, as well as a list of the participants. Here too, uh, we have offered our IEEE members some exclusive privileges. Uh, our members can own up to 30 workspaces and each workspace can have up to 300 individuals belong to it. So we've tried to create not only a workspace that works for uh, any everybody, 
but a workspace that works for our members who may have much more broad, diverse interests in their research, as well as their uh, pursuits for collaboration. Uh, as with most platforms, we offer a messaging capability as well, and uh, not only uh, for informal chats with peers, but there's also the ability to set up some group messaging. So you can set up small groups and message them uh, very similar to what you experience with other platforms without having to leave Collaboratech. So that ability is there for you to use uh, when it's needed, and I know that I use it quite often for informal or quick chats uh, with my fellow colleagues. One of the powers of IEEE is the power of community building, where we have a shared purpose around a particular, could be technical topic, it could be a topic around business or entrepreneurship. And there are 90 plus communities on Collaboratech that uh, individuals can join. Uh, some of our more popular communities range from artificial intelligence to entrepreneurship, and certainly our global uh, student exchange is a large community as well. And what's wonderful about the Global Student Exchange is it allows student members to engage with student members who reside <clears throat> outside the geography of their student branch or their section. And then certainly we have an annual celebration every year called IEEE Day that happens in the autumn. And there's a very vibrant and exciting community dedicated to that as well. So I would encourage you, if you haven't already, uh, visit the communities area of Collaboratech, uh, navigate, find communities that are of interest to you and feel free to join them. One of the most exciting opportunities for us that came about this uh, past year was the introduction of what we call student uh, section and student branch gateways. And if you log into the platform, if you're an IEEE member, you will see an option called uh, IEEE section. And if you're a student, you will see student branch. And if you click one of those uh, section gateways or student branch gateways, you will see information that's relevant to your section in your student branch. Uh, not only that new members who are joining it, but also uh, your volunteer leadership for your organization. We also really recognize our members through grade elevation. So we like to highlight and showcase the members within those sections or student branches who have had a grade elevation, as well as members who have earned uh, badges on the platform. So this is a really great resource to complement the website that your section or student branch has. If you just wanna pop in quickly to see what's happening in your section or student branch, you can do that from your gateway right from the member console. Many of our students, uh, as well as our higher grade members are involved with research and uh, publishing. And to that end, we offer a literary, search, a literary search as well as a library module to help with that. Uh, the library is a very powerful tool where our users organize and classify their research, as well as develop bibliographies and other uh, important uh, parts of, you know, tools that are important for the publishing process. Uh, individuals can connect Dropbox or Latex to the Collaboratech platform, and we've created some very neat transitions and APIs so that uh, once you create your bibliographies, you can seamlessly uh, import and export that to Latex. The literature search is very powerful. It allows you to search across IEEE Explore, as well as other publishers. Uh, very powerful research uh, capability. And then as you find uh, research results, you can add them to your library so that you can go back and refer to them later on. We have a, a section in Collaboratech for career services, and uh, what that allows you to do is not only uh, uh, establish a mentoring preference, uh, if you'd like to be an IEEE mentor, but also to establish your employment preferences. Uh, upload your CV, and then as uh, prospective employers are on the platform and they're looking for talent, uh, by having your CV uploaded as well as your preferences, it helps uh, increase your visibility uh, to, to preference your preferences and visibility to employers who are seeking talent. Mentoring provides an incredible opportunity, uh, an opportunity for our members to give back, as well as the opportunity for members who are seeking uh, wisdom and knowledge. And, and that too is within the Collaboratech. You can go in and find mentors who have already volunteered and activated their mentor preferences, or if you would like to be a mentor, you can activate that as well through the career services. So again, this brings together the ability for us to bring that collective body of wisdom 
uh, across the IEEE and transfer that knowledge to a younger generation. Or in some cases, it could be uh, uh, more senior members who are looking at learn, they want to learn about new technology. So often they will, uh, they will participate in what we call reverse mentoring, where they will seek out uh, the younger generation who are subject matter experts in new technologies so that they can learn through that relationship from a younger uh, generation of members. And in that regard, we as an organization are very fortunate in that we have four generations of members. And when you think about the power of that, that we have four generations of knowledge and uh, right from student members, right up to life members who have been with us perhaps for uh, 35 or 40 years. And so there's an incredible knowledge base there that can be tapped at any given time to pass along educational understanding and pass along lessons learned in their career. Last year, we rolled out a very, very exciting capability, and that was badging uh, based on individuals' participation on the platform. Uh, the badging offering on Collaboratech is different than what's offered from educational activities, and that on Collaboratech, what we're trying to do is to credential and badge participation in communities as well as collaborations. So as I'm sharing here, we have different levels, different types of badges. Uh, some may be badges just related to your participation in a single community. Other badges may be related to participation across several communities. And then just 10 weeks ago, we uh, rolled out what's called the IEEE Puzzlers. And this is specifically related to mathematical brain teasers. And it's been very, very exciting to watch this community grow. It was officially launched 10 weeks ago, and it already has surpassed 1,000 participants in the community. So we're looking at some very exciting activities to roll out this autumn around uh, puzzlers and uh, brain teasers, and really turning this not only into a, a challenge per se, but how can we take the opportunity of puzzling and turn that into an educational opportunity as well uh, to teach and inform about the approach to problem solving, uh, the approach to, a, to approach to brain teasers, and how do we teach that methodology and how to tackle some of these uh, challenges? Because as our students will go out into their professional career, they're gonna have many different types of, of challenges uh, thrown at them. So the methodology and the process to approach a challenge is as important as the solution itself. So I'm gonna wrap up. Uh, in summary, we are a great organization, and we are a great organization because of you, the people who belong to our organization. Uh, you, you have the talent, you have the passion, you have the knowledge, and what we seek to do here is really to bring that together and make that knowledge collectively available across the world and to each other. Because ultimately, the education doesn't necessarily, it doesn't come from the platform per se, it comes from the transfer of knowledge between us. And you know that's the greatest gift that we can ever give to our members is providing access to that knowledge to the great people who belong to the organization. So I would encourage you uh, to explore further. You may be knowledgeable of Collaboratech already. I'd, I would encourage you to explore uh, perhaps new capabilities that you've not used. And if you've not signed up to the platform, I'd encourage you to get started because uh, great things happen Great things happen when we discover each other and we discover our talent, and it takes us down paths and journeys that we perhaps had never envisioned. Uh, the platform is open. You do not need to be an IEEE member to belong. And so if you have friends and colleagues who are not IEEE members, encourage them to sign up. I think they'll be greatly rewarded. We know through our satisfaction surveys with the platform that the non-members who join the platform are very appreciative and they get a lot of value out of it. So I'm going to wrap up today. I'll be happy to take any questions. And then certainly, uh, if you would like a follow-up uh, presentation on any of these topics, we'll be happy to make that available as well. And we have a great support team. Uh, Linda Uslinger is the Program Director for Collaboratech, a wonderful resource. And we have several volunteer ambassadors uh, who are very knowledgeable of the program. Uh, in fact, we have many ambassadors from India who uh, would be happy to spend more time with you, uh, have workshops on specific capabilities. So with that, I thank you for your time and uh, we'll be happy to take any questions. The session for question and answer is open now. We request you all to kindly post your doubts on the chat window.
Okay, I saw one chat there. How do we contact John Day for workshops in our student branch? Well, you can contact me at the following email address, j.day at ieee.org. j.day at ieee.org. And what I will do is I will forward your request to Linda Uslinger, and she will work with our team, uh, our volunteer ambassadors and our staff team to ensure that we can uh, give you the education that you want. Wonderful, John. It was such a nice informative session. It would be very useful to all of our attendees. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing your valuable insights with us today. On behalf of Team Education 4.0, we would like to present you with a virtual memento as a token of our gratitude. We request you to kindly accept, sir. I kindly accept, and I am very grateful to be here with you all today. You are wonderful professionals. You bring a lot to the organization, and I very much look forward to uh, working with you in the future. Yes. Thank uh, you, sir. Shatakshi and Shritma, I think we should have a couple of screenshots. Uh, can you request all of them to open the video so that we can have? Yes, we request everyone to kindly switch on their videos for a group photograph. Uh, yeah, hi, John. Am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Yeah, thank you so much for your wonderful overview of Collaboratech. And uh, I, I strongly like, I am personal personal fan of those Collaboratech batch challenges and I would encourage all the professors on the call to explore and to share this opportunity with all the students of their student branches. Because I personally see, hey, why not network with all the people across the globe without any barrier and Collaboratech is our answer to it. Thank you so much, John, for that uh, great presentation. You're welcome, Ramnik. Yes, and, and by the way, to answer your question, uh, we will have some badge challenges that will launch this autumn when uh, the school semesters reconvene. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. I would request everyone to turn on the camera for a group photo. Uh, Rashid, remember, I guess only uh, panelists can open up their camera participants yeah, are in yeah, the lobby. Yeah, right? this moment because it's okay. I think there are hundreds around now, like it's difficult. At least for panelists, we can. Thank you. Thank you, John. Very welcome. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Our as our next guest speaker, we have with us Mr. Radeep Krishna, who will be speaking on the topic digital pedagogy. Mr. Radeep Krishna Radhakrishnan Nair is the assistant professor of Department of EC, School of Electronics and Communication Engineering, Kalasalingam Academy of Research and Education, Tamil Nadu. He is a senior member of IEEE and is also a member of IEEE EDS Society. We welcome you, sir, and request you to kindly address the gathering. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all IEEE and uh, I'm audible to you. Is it audible? Yes, Radhi. you are, you yeah, are th audible. Thank you. Uh, oh, it's very, very great day that I could meet a lot of people here and talking about uh, various technologies on educational technologies. And it is a great uh, to know a lot of things and it, uh, I'm very humbled. At the same time, I'm very uh, excited to share some of the things which I know uh, with all you, and uh, it is a great thing because of my experience in teaching uh, in engineering for a long time. So I'd like to, I'll, I will share my screen here. Is it visible? Can you see the screen? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Sir. Okay. Okay, so the topic today I was just covering is the tools for effective online teaching, a simple digital pedagogy. Now, this is uh, something very important, especially with respect to the people who are working as a faculty, as well as the people who are trainers 
because uh, today we are dealing with the digital pedagogy as a whole. So basically, the the question that lies is uh, digital pedagogy is coming. Are you ready? Because the goal is to make everyone move along with the changes we adopted during this uh, COVID times, because of most of the people are only in online. Learning is completely changed from a classroom to an online mode. So the digital pedagogy, what is a digital pedagogy? So if you search it, you will be finding a lot of things. You will be knowing that it is like a critical learning, conceptual, it's curriculum based, it's a classroom based. So there are a lot of questions that comes to our mind. So we have to find these things. So that's why we have a four important things in this uh, in the cover, in which I'm going to cover: search, find, create, and share. So here, first, what we will do is we will search it. Uh, what is a digital? What? How do we design a pedagogy with keeping everyone in the mind? Because uh, the basics is it's all from the tools which we take. How are we going to make it use in the syllabus? How to uh, connect with the curriculum? How the different technologies are going to integrate it? So and so. So the basic thing is the technology is coming inside the classroom. How do you facilitate it? So it is a, such a challenge that everyone has now nowadays. Everyone is facing it. One or the other way, they are finding some solution to it. So I have some simple solutions which I would like to share here so that you can also find it very interesting. So technology is becoming a teach. Tech is becoming teach today. So without technology, you can't do teaching here. So we should know exactly what tool is good for you and how to make it usable for our purpose. So this is the this is the what we used to see as a theoretically. If you look at what is a digital pedagogy, there are a few things which I would like you to see it. What the Kohler and Mishra has uh, described it in during 2006 in his one groundbreaking paper on technological pedagogical content knowledge. So it is it's a amalgamation of technological knowledge, content knowledge, and pedagogical knowledge. So if you have these three things, then we can combine it to form a better digital pedagogy. So basically, what we have is that we should have the developed sensitivity to dynamic transactional relationship. That relationship, what we used to have in our classrooms, we need to bring inside the online learning. And that is the biggest challenge we are having it. So for how to use that a perfect technology. So instructional level we can give, academic level we can give, and educational technological level we can give it. So these are the three ways. And therefore we need to find it, how to do that. So there is a Bloom's taxonomy is there, which is very popular. The job Bloom's uh, came with this idea of sensitivity to dynamic transactional relationship, but it is it is something which is applied everywhere. We have the cognitive, psychomotor, and affective, which will describe knowledge, skills, and attitudes. But what is missing here is emotional intelligence. So how do you going to use that? So emotional intelligence, as per the Daniel Goleman, a famous American psychologist. Uh, described emotional intelligence in a very five sphere of elements. So accordingly, he just gave the self-awareness, self-aware, social awareness, self-management, and relationship management. So when you have these things, you can control a perspective of emotionality, and emotional intelligence is going to play a very important role in the learning perspective. So digital pedagogy is nowadays going to deal these things very easily. So here, how do we create it? So there is a concept called learning molecule. So you have an outcome, you have a content, you have an assessment strategy, you have some learning activities which you need to integrate it, and we call it as a combined molecule, a learning molecule. So there is something which is very important strategy which we need to follow if you want to create a perfect learning molecule that is backward learning design. So backward learning design means you have to fix what you need, outcome, the desired result, then you go back to create strategy to assess that. Then you go back to the experiences, what you wanted to create it for the students or the people who are the trace going to be the training in participating into the event. So there has to be created very effectively. So we already know this technique flipped the classroom, which is very popular which is accepted throughout the world. Large number of students and faculties have used it and it has benefited so many people. But the flip to classroom is very much different because we will be having more classroom activities than the home activities. 
So normally traditional, we have the more homework given, but when it comes to the classroom, when you know, the flipped is going to play a very important role and flipped, you can do it, but how can you do it in online? So there are so many technological challenges out there. But when it comes to the assessment strategies, again, the strategies is becoming very important because we have a word called equifinality. Now, what is equifinality means you can use different paths to reach the same goal and address the same pedagogical issue. So therefore, we need to address this. We have three important things required, representations, engagement, and expressions. So what is representation? You need to give a tool if you're choosing a tool, the tool should have multiple format, a test, a graphics, audio, video, or a combination, or a virtual reality or augmented reality. And the best practice is you mix all of them. Sensibly, you identify which one is better accordingly to the group you needed to deliver. You identify it and mix it up. Screencast, audio rendering, presentation of slides, charts, graphs, this makes one good sense. And apart from that, we can use some lecture capture softwares. So some of them are very famous available. One is the Imparters tool, which is a server based. Then we have Khan Academy, which is already following. Then another one, Merlot, is a very good tool. So these tools can all use for representation. And one thing which I would like to show is some infographic tools are going to play a very important role in digital pedagogy, like PicoChart, Visualize, Doodly. I like it. The PPT templates that normally we used to do it, gaming tools, which you can refer from MIT. So Doodly is one such good tool, which I will just show you how it is good. Then we should know how to share it. Once you create something, you should know how to share it. So there is something what we call the infographic pedagogy. Now, this is something very interesting because as a user, you have a concrete experience, a feeling. OK, so that you have to reach it. So for that, the first you have to start from a reflection, an observation, a watching by watching what is happening. Then you will assimilate it and think and watch and you go to the abstract or conceptualization where you continue the thinking and you converge again and you go to an active experimentation where you do it. And finally, you accommodate and feel and bring to a feeling sensation or what we call concrete experience. So this is something what we need in the digital pedagogy. So this is what we call one of the arm of the digital pedagogy of infographic. So to do this, there are many ways you can do. Concept map is one of them. Some you can give a screencast with modeling or some kind of assignment you can give. So these things are all very useful. And apart from that, you have to do engagement. You have to make them do it because engage will generate interest. Motivate will give you sustained efforts. Learn will give you support of self-control. So these things will help you to make the people. So multiple things you have to give, more choices you have to give. So the biggest problem is how you keep the interest of the student. So we need to give more choices to them and we have to prepare relevant content for them. So therefore, we have to give recognition for what they've done, tools for collaboration. Then we have to give the feedbacks to improve. At the same time, we have to give different challenges for same activities. So these are some of the things we need to maintain. And self-regulation is very important because then only they will be able to understand, access the understanding and reflect in the courses. For that, we can use online quizzes, flashcards, online journals, blogs, etc. So some of the survey mechanism, which is available in internet or what we call the social network tool and social bookmarking tool is very useful and very come very handy if you are wanted to take your classroom to the next level. So some of these are shown here. And apart from that, we can bring to the essay test multiple choice questions, which is available rubrics based, then some uh, comparisons, e-portfolio, you can tell them to do e-portfolio. There are so many softwares that are available. And apart from that, you have to make them increase the access with laptops, mobile, because people are using more mobile phones nowadays than laptops. So all the facility has to be accessed. And you have to bring increased flexibility, test to speech, that is very important, then increase the choice. So these are some of the student based goals which you have to keep in mind when you design the pedagogy. So at the end, what is most is the big difference. You, you can find it out. 
So if I just take one technological expectation axis, so this is something very important where you will checking the asynchronous of playing and synchronous way of learning and you see how the axis people are locating. You can see these are some of the tools which today people are using for digital pedagogy. So some of the tools like Google Apps, uh, concept maps, presentation, wiki tools, blog tools, screencast, LMS. These things are all comes under different platforms you can see. So the more you go near to that blue color line, the more it will be more collaborative. So this is something which is very important. So you have to choose a tool which is go near that to that blue line. That tool is going to be more collaborative. People will like it and people will more people will spend in it because today the learning outcome of digital pedagogy will become better if you do more collaboration. And some of the other digital pedagogy tools like video conference tool like Adobe Connect, very fantastic tool, a background, a Zoom, which is already, you know, Slack, Teams, all those things are very useful. Then lecture capture tools like Imparters, TechSmith Relay, Cultura Capture, Panopto, Tegrity, Echo360, then online screen tools like Screenosmatic, Jing, Screener, Overstream, then screencast softwares like Cantasia, Adopt, Captiva, then active presenters, Nugget, then podcast, of course, podcast is very important because you need to record your voice and you can give many of your instructions and other things through a podcast mechanism that is very good in bringing a very lively digital pedagogy into the classroom. And apart from that, you can bring some on recorded online like voice thread, Animoto, then instructional materials like Poplet, Test Mind Map, Time Streams, Visual Literacy, and Venn diagram. So these are some of the tools which is going to be very useful for the digital pedagogy. Now you should understand that data visualization is an art as much as a science. So some things, some skills are required. So if you want to properly choose a tool, the first and foremost skill today, what we require, how to give a narrative photography. You should know how to create a photograph. Of course, most of us are having mobile phones with us. We should, we all know how to take photographs. So something we need to use it effectively for the digital pedagogy. So let us have a look at here. You have to create some characters, you have to place the objects and you create a full story. So let us have a look at here. This is one example told by my one of my friend photographer, a character mythical flying snake, a prince in Hyderabad, a husband and a wife, place, subway, station, glacier, trop tropical forest, an object, wine, bottle, forklift, tractor, tiger. Now you need to, you need to match it up. So there is something called matching the characters with the place, husband and wife in a glacier with forklift, Mythical flying snake with a tractor tiger, prince in subsistence station with a wine bottle. So this makes sense. So likewise, you have to create when you have a narrative photography is very important today. So when you do that, there are certain things what we call the pro democratizing of photography. For example, you have to you show how to use the grid in your mobile phone. You should know properly how to hold it. You have to use the thumb properly and you have to follow some simple photographic rules. So let us see what are those rules you need to do it. Always remember you have to fill the frame, keep the lighting shades, use the frame within the frame, use the rule of the third that is golden point within the frame, use the leading lines when you take a photograph, then follow the odd numbers, try to put odd numbers into the photograph, use the symmetry wherever you're taking is a road, a line of garden or a table in your laboratory, you take a symmetrical line, so likewise. So these are some of the simple routes which you need to follow. And once you do that, you can use any of the softwares which you want to create it. For example, this is the Dootly. My experience suggests that Dootly is a minimum you have to get it. A good mobile phone app you have. If you have, you can transfer it. A good headset is good. And if you have that, this is a software. You, you just design it. You create a sound. You mix it with an exit animations. Then you have the video. So this is something very simple in the Dootly. You can create and make it. So this is one example of a digital video which is available here, which I can just show you. Is there some audio playing in the background, uh, Ravi? Yeah, yes, audio is playing. Yeah, but uh, I think, um, yeah, not I able to hear. Okay, listen. that's okay. Okay, okay, uh, no problem. Uh, let me have. Okay, we will. Uh, let me see. I yeah, am not video. sure. Will it be because uh, this new version? I think uh, is not yeah. doing that accepting voice. 
Okay, no problem. We'll yeah, move on to the next yeah, slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so okay, so this is a this is the audio which uh, this is the animation which you can create. Doodly is very simple. Uh, what what the thing is that you need uh, the software is a very simple license software which you can get it and you can make it. And uh, in that oh, you can create characters. Now what I wanted you to do is you since you have learned the narrative photography very well, you can take photograph, then you use your mobile phone any of the cartoon image maker. Convert that photograph into cartoon image maker, bring on to the duty, you can create a story. Now that is very important. You can bring it to the classroom. It's going to be very fun, very effective, and you can have a lot of creative things you can bring into the classroom. So the next one which I would like to show you is the video content preparation. This is for the online classes. So we have a software we have, which is we call it as Davency Resolve. Now this software is the same software which is used in all the Hollywood movies. So it is freely available in internet open software. You can download it. This software, you can use it. You can take around uh, one hour time. If you have sufficient time, you can spend some time. Uh, refers uh, some YouTube videos. You can learn it by yourself. It's a very simple and very good software. Now what I did is I'll just show you. What I did is I followed the narrative photography. So just followed all the rules which I've told you. So my son is standing there. He is fixing my mobile camera onto the camera stand and behind there is a green screen and I'm myself standing there and we just taking the video. Just taking the video. Then after taking the video, I just take it to the software. I have this uh, green screen remover. So there is a Chrome key. So many keys are available. You can use any one of them. I have used the Delta key so you can use any of the keys and you can remove the background. Then whatever the image, whatever the videos, whatever the animations which you have already created, either using Doodly or any such software, you can bring it to the back and you can merge it. So your lecture with the animations, with your other things can be merged it within seconds. It will take nearly 20 minutes if you wanted to have a 10 minutes video and it you will be able to create it and you can resize it, you can convert it and you can get the output in a better format. There are different options that are available mp4 different versions are available so you can choose it which platform you want your video to be developed and accordingly you can bring it on so this is one example which is this again if i play it i don't know whether sound will be heard no no sound is available okay no problem so this is a simple software which you can use it the name of the software is davinci resolve and the last one, the best uh, one of the good tool which I found very effective in digital pedagogy is the open board. So this is a very simple tool which is used in. Uh, I hope I, I think it is came from European Union in Switzerland, Swiss made project. So this is a very simple tool. What is the advantage of open board is you can have all the tools can bring into this. And this is something very important because you can have your video. You can have your video presentations, you can have your PPTs, you can have your writings, even you can have your graphs, engineering, mechanics, calculator, everything you can bring into a single platform. So this is something but very useful open board which will support in the digital pedagogy. And apart from that, once you have these things, then you can share your content in any of these LMS platform like Camelo or otherwise with Canvas. So likewise, this digital pedagogy can be implemented very effectively in classroom. So this is a simple one, a simple few steps which I found very effective and I think this will be very interesting to you. Thank you so much for giving me this time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing your valuable insights with us today. The session for Thank question and you. answer is open now. We request you all to kindly post your doubts on the chat window. Thank you, sir, for joining Very us good. today. Yeah, thank you. On behalf of Team Education 4.2, we would like to present you with a virtual memento as a token of our gratitude. Uh, Sahibia, if you could please share your screen. I think uh, okay. So, on behalf of Education 4.0 team, we would like to present you with a virtual memento as a token of our gratitude. We request you to kindly accept.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us today. Our last but not the least guest speaker for the evening is Mr. Anurag Sahai, who will be speaking on the topic AI in education. Mr. Anurag Sahai graduated from IIT Delhi and started his career with IBM, where he worked on performance modeling and helped improve the performance characteristics of the Mac kernel. He joined Nagaro in late 2016 and has been leading the data science and AI practice at Nagaro. I would like to welcome you, sir, and request you to kindly deliver the session. Thank you, uh, Sakshi, and it's a pleasure. Let me just quickly share my screen um, uh, to be able to share my deck. Uh, I don't see permissions to share the screen. Is there? Yes, sir. Uh, something just I need give to me do? a minute because uh, my students gave me this first right. I'm uh, really looking forward how to do all these things. Sure, sure. Yes, I think I'm able to. Oh, uh, yes, I can. Thank you. Yes. Wonderful. Hopefully, you all can see it now. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Great, great. Thank you so much. And first of all, thank you all for uh, having me in this. Um, a uh, very interesting session that you all have arranged for. Um, I am. Um, I have some uh, background in education, um, and while I am leading the practice, uh, the data science and AI practice at Nagaro, uh, a part of my history in the last fifteen years have been has been, you know, uh, in the area of teaching and learning and helping children uh, come to grips with computer science. Uh, and it is in those areas where I also experimented a lot with machine learning and data science. Uh, so, so this is a topic which is uh, something that is close to my heart. So I'm very happy to have a chance to share with you all some of my thoughts um, on this topic. Um, I want to I, I want to uh, sort of you know take you uh, in a direction um, which is first of all uh, inspirational, um, and at the same time. Uh, you know, helps illustrate the prerequisites around why technology uh, or why AI specifically is a very good um, intervention in the area of education. Um, one of the um, prerequisites, uh, you know, uh, that that allows us to, you know, bring a lot of AI and data science and other um, you know, uh, contemporary technologies to education is the availability of digital platforms and, and more specifically digital educational platforms. I, I want to tell you a story about a, a person named Charles Best, uh, who was a teacher, is still a teacher, um, and, you know, in the year 2000, uh, he's a passionate teacher and he was uh, teaching in a small school um, for underprivileged children in the Bronx area of New York. Um, and as part of his teaching assignments, he often had to share a lot of material with his students and their children, the students were not really in a place economically, you know, uh, 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 situation where they could, you know, afford a lot of what he wanted, you know, them to learn and so on. So what he did was he started, you know, finding um, uh, sponsors from his friend in the form of his friends, right? He'd reach out to his friends and say, you know, here is a project I wanted to, I wanted the children to learn about this particular um, piece of art, you know, this particular literature book, and you know, we can you sponsor a few copies of this book and so on, right? So he started in that manner, and uh, very soon he realized that there were lots of people who were willing to help. Uh, there is no dearth of helpful people around in our society. And this got him thinking. He was like, you know, if I could find 20 people in my proximate um, contacts, then there probably are, you know, 2 million people out there who were, who would probably like to participate and help out small projects that are happening in this classroom. So what he did was he got somebody to design a little website for him. And then he started posting small classroom projects on that website. And uh, 
uh, those projects would be very simple projects like projects about you know stationery that they needed some stationery in the classroom and if somebody could sponsor that uh, or they needed to you know they were planning an outing with the students to some museum and if somebody could sponsor that little event and so on uh, this is how this whole little effort started uh, and very soon he realized that he has uh, you know a whole range of possibilities up to him to be able to sponsor a bunch of projects. Very soon, he was flooded with a lot of requests, and he started asking for people to volunteer and help him, uh, you know, figure out which were those proposals or projects that really needed to be funded. So, uh, you know, he started receiving uh, projects and proposals in hundreds and thousands very, very quickly. And so there were a team of 10 volunteers, 20 volunteers that started coming in and helping out. And and when you're when you're when you're looking at uh, proposals and projects, you know, and and these are all volunteers. They of course are looking at those proposals from many different perspectives. One of them is, you know, which one is the more needy project? Which one would be a more actionable project? Is this really something that will help the children? Um, which one would create the most impact, and so on? And while these people were doing all this stuff, right? They of course come with their own biases, right? I mean, as people, we have our own orientation, our background, our context all of that plays out right and so very soon you realize that you know uh, there is a certain direction that that the particular that that a lot of those projects that were getting approved were taking um, and he wanted to you know solve both those problems he was like you know i am i am um, i have a platform which allows for such a, a mapping to happen uh, at the same time i have all these biases what could i do right and, and this is the this is the motivation for technology, right? To step in in a form, right? Now, of course, I, I'm of course uh, cutting the story a little short here, and taking you into the specifics of the technology a little bit, just so that I can motivate the next step. Uh, soon, you know, the whole idea was if I am going to have to, you know, process thousand proposals and do it in a fair way, I need some kind of an algorithmic approach to be able to do that, right? So the first problem is a data set problem, right? How could I? Uh, build upon intelligence in my algorithm so that the algorithm could support these volunteers at some level, right? So, so that was the first thing. The second bit is, of course, you know, what do I do? How do I make this uh, identification of which of those projects are the most important projects? And how do I take away the biases that typically exist in, in those decisions? And then the third bit was like, no matter how cool an algorithm he would choose, uh, it is very likely that the algorithm is going to make mistakes. Uh, a mistake here might mean like, you know, it it may, it takes a project and selects a project for sponsorship. Maybe that was not the best project to select. And maybe, you know, sometimes the algorithm skips a good project and sometimes it selects a bad project. So what and how should it all be uh, integrated with the rest of the uh, human intelligence to be able to make a good decision, right? So how do you consume outcomes of these models? And, and this is where, you know, um, a lot of uh, interesting thing, uh, things that he tried and bought to his uh, uh, digital platform. Uh, as a result of this desire to, you know, formalize this, uh, it also took him uh, in a direction of thinking more um, in a more uh, specific manner, right? What could be those uh, attributes that could really help him make choices about which projects uh, are really worth supporting, right? So you could see a whole bunch of information, right, that he selected, including things like essays that the teachers would post uh, to justify why they think that this particular project in their school uh, need, needs a sponsor. And then he would, you know, use all this information or uh, use all this information to train his algorithms to be able to achieve an outcome that they want, that they thought would be a fair assessment of those projects. Of course, the modeling bit is, you know, a lot of data scientists, AI people sort of give a lot of importance to model. It is important. It's an important thing. But I really think that's in the in the scheme of things, it's one of the more simple pieces. Uh, it's a technology, it's a technical piece. One can sort of solve it with, you know, 10 different ways. Uh, and of course, there are some, you know, some models which are better and, and, and all of that, right? But then the third bit, right, which is that if he's going to use algorithms to be able to make decisions, uh, there has to be a good understanding of why the algorithms chose what they did, right? So there has to be a good amount of explainability 
uh, that needs to be present in 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 the models and the approach that he takes with you know all of these little considerations and thoughts uh, his web application platform his digital platform today is doing you know um, ha has managed about 874 million or, or you know 87 million dollars uh, worth of um, transactions and it's supporting you know, a, a million plus projects, it's it's helping students in the uh, amounts of 35 million or, or, you know, a huge number there, right? A small idea like that from where he started uh, has ended up becoming a very big cornerstone of being able to run uh, amazing things and make amazing things happen in a classroom. Um, and, and this facilitation, uh, which I want to point out, is is because of two key ideas one is the availability of a digital platform uh, and the second bit is to scale and deal with the complexity right the scale in this case is the desire to reach out to lots of other people perhaps the entire of entirety of us and the complexity bit was all around how do you deal with things like you know good decision making uh, fairness and so on Right, and these are the motivators that today that this platform is is a is a pretty amazing um, and a and a success story. You can look at it. It's called DonorsChoose.org, and, and it's quite a quite a platform providing a significant amount of value. So that's story one. Uh, I was very affected by the story when I first came across it, and I, it made me think a lot about how practically in real life uh, AI or technology is going to you know, come in and change the way we learn, the change the way we teach and so on. Here's another story which which is very impressive. This one comes from China. Uh, and you all know that China is, you know, fairly similar to India when it comes to the state of primary education, maybe slightly better, um, but, but still nevertheless, you know, dealing with the similar kinds of problems. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, the, their primary education is not all that good, just like we, you know, in the state that that it is in India, uh, they uh, they have a lot of tuition centers, uh, and and people focus a lot on grades and getting good marks and getting through you know good colleges. Everybody's focused and obsessed with grades uh, at, at some level, right? And learning takes a second seat or a back seat to you know the aspiration of getting good grades. Uh, the other important uh, difficulty that they have, again, very similar to what we have in India, is the ratio of children to teachers is really, really lopsided. Uh, and, and this has to do with the economics, the demographics, the population uh, size, and so on, right? Very similar. So here, a bunch of uh, people, again, educational reformists, uh, decided that they should do something about this. And, and they relied, they from the very first day, uh, decided that they obviously need, need to use technology to be able to solve a problem like this. The interesting uh, approach that they took here, uh, you know, I've tried to capture that in two little visuals so that I could communicate what, what they were doing, was to, you know, uh, was all driven by this desire that every child should have their own teacher and, and a good teacher at that, that the teacher should know what the child uh, child feels and how the child's feeling, what can, what are they learning, what are they not learning, and then the teacher should appropriately be able to walk and journey with the, with the child, with the student. Um, so so the, the big idea there was to really take content materials that existed and represent them, um, you know, as subtopics. Uh, so I would take, let's say, you know, a topic like mathematics and break it into several topics like ratio and proportion, percentages, unitary method, uh, calculus, and so on, right? And then I would take each one of those topics and break it into further topics and then and, and then and so on and so on, right? And this is what you see in the left hand side, which is what is represented as a knowledge graph. Um, the knowledge graph is just a graphical representation uh, of, you know, uh, content uh, where there's some specific relationship between these uh, child nodes and the parent nodes and the cousin nodes and the grandfather nodes and so on. Uh, typically, it's a, a directed acyclic graph so that you could traverse that in a in a meaningful manner and, and not get caught up in cycles and loops. So, so there are some properties of these graphs which are, you know, which make them use uh, usable uh, and, and so on. The big problem for them was that, you know, here is, for example, a child 
uh, and the, the knowledge in the child can be represented as a small graph. And, and this is the desired state of the knowledge in that topic that they would like. Then the question was, how do you take this, you know, what the child knows to a desired state of what they should know, right? And, and this is the essential problem uh, that they are solving. Um, and, and this whole uh, approach uh, is, is typically now known as adaptive learning, uh, but the kinds of complexity in engineering and technology and data science and AI that's being used to deliver something like this is quite uh, significant and substantial. As a result of this, right, as a result of this play of technology and, you know, uh, aspiration, today they have about 1700 schools uh, with only 3000 teaching staff, right? So if you do that math, it is about less than two teachers per school, right? Which is, which is really, really efficient. Uh, and they're running this in 200 different cities in China, and they offer about five or six different courses from preschool, you know, from, uh, sorry, primary school, secondary school and high school. So a huge set of offerings uh, with personalized learning, with adaptive learning thrown in, and it's a combination of all of those things that they are uh, trying to do. Again, you know, a digital platforms um, combined with scale and uh, a desire to address complexity are the key ingredients uh, that, you know, is playing out in, in, this, in this whole play of how technology is affecting educational outcomes. So that's all good, right? And then those two stories are fairly uh, representative of how different people are trying to bring AI into education in many, many different ways. Uh, but one of the important things that, you know, um, we should think about uh, is not just from a technology centric point of view, but look at the real problem of education, right? And, and, and try and frame the problem in such a manner so that one can see where technology interventions and specifically AI like specific interventions could really help. Right, and then if you look at what those ch challenges are, what those problems are, one of the problems is, I, I'm very inspired by this particular educationist. Her name is Candice um, Tilly. Uh, she's from Carnegie Mellon and, and she's done some amazing research in, in terms of how she thinks about education. Uh, and, and here is, you know, some of those, um, uh, some of the learnings from her that I'm sharing. Uh, I hope it's valuable to you all. You know, one of the problem that she describes as the problem of education is the is the diversity of the learner. Uh, and then the diversity of the learner doesn't mean just, you know, the fact that they are different genders, like it's a boy or a girl or people with different cultures, but more specifically, right? Uh, it, it's like the different background knowledge each person has when they are sitting in the classroom, uh, the skills that they bring uh, to a classroom and the future goals they have, they're all different, right? And if you are dealing with a, uh, a student for, you know, a classroom full of students, every child has a different background context of knowledge. They all have different skills. It's not like some people have skills and some don't, they just have different types of skills and their career aspirations are different, right? And you're teaching them in one class, hoping to achieve the same outcome you know, as if there was just one type of student that is present. And, and as a teacher, I've always struggled with that idea, right? I mean, I sort of, when I came across this and uh, I was, I, you know, it, it, my way of looking at the class changed and I really became overwhelmed by the idea that how, how, how many different types of children are present and how can I as a teacher really cater or bring to value, uh, you know, learning for each one of those different types of student that is present. So diversity of a learner is a big problem in education and, and, um, and one needs to look at that in a very fundamental way. The second important thing that, you know, uh, that's really important and she points out, uh, Candice points out, is this thing called learning is complex, right? If you ask people today, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, especially in India, they, they like to teach by starting from the basics, right? They will first teach you alphabets and then they will teach you words and then they will teach you sentences and then they will teach you, you know, uh, paragraphs and essays and so on, right? Uh, they, they, there is a certain way a methodology to, to how things are taught. Uh, and, and then some people are like, you know, there's a whole bunch of counter revolution happening about like, well, you know, how about if we teach slightly differently? How about if we teach people first to use things? Like if, what if I, taught them sentences first, and then as part of the sentence, 
bring them you know uh, become make them aware of words and 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 then you know automatically the alphabets get picked up and so on right and there are some amazing experiments right but you can sort of see that there are all kinds of differences in the way that people approach learning uh, then you know you can make it very very more complicated because learning is a journey you can start with like very intense focus in one area or you know a broad focus in many areas and then gradually you know widen it uh, how do you use tests uh, what proportions of questions do you ask and so on right uh, many many interesting uh, challenges in this space and and there are so many different ways people approach it so learning is complex and it's not a simple thing that one one can just solve the problem you know through one approach or so on right and then here is the the big idea of technology, right? I mean, ask anybody about how technology is going to change education. One of the simplest answers is, you know, access and convenience. You look at all the massively online course, uh, you know, the MOOC phenomena that is going on today, right? Whether it's edX or Coursera or Udacity or Udemy, what is that that they're solving? They're solving the problem of access and convenience, right? They want to make all kinds of courses be available to everybody in the convenience of their homes, you know, uh, and that's one intervention. It's a very powerful intervention. It has changed us in the last seven, eight, seven to 10 years. It's a very powerful technology intervention in the area of education. The second kind of, uh, you know, thing that you see is in this whole area of simulating, right? So uh, when I was, you know, learning physics, I mean, I never saw simulations of how often, uh, you know, uh, of a simple harmonic motion, except for a little diagram that I had in the book with a little spring tied to a block along a wall, right? Uh, I, I, nowadays, right, with all these simulations and animations and videos and God knows all the different things that exist, right? It's so easy to visualize an outcome, right? And again, this is a very powerful intervention of, you know, technology in education. And then third most, you know, third important thing that you can see today is peer learning. So in a classroom, I mean, I'm taking classes today in Flaksha University, right? And I'm teaching and I am in a classroom with 35 children and each one of them are typing away and commenting and discussing a question while I'm teaching. They're all learning from each other. And, and this is a very powerful idea, right? And this is very different from peer learning in a classroom where children sort of stay quiet all the time and just pay attention to one speaker. Uh, we, are, we are definitely ways, you know, changed from, you know, how things used to be. Now, these three uh, powerful ideas, right, are motivators for us to definitely move towards technology. And, and the moment we do this, right, each one of those three areas are basically a reason to bring in technology like artificial intelligence and data science and uh, augmented reality and robotics and and many other things that that we should be building so so there is there is a really a good reason but i mean you know uh, all of it is has to be prerequisited by a lot of these other things that 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 are needed but then if you think about you know uh, all those three things are good but but is that really the revolution in ai and education uh, at some level. So actually it is not, right? I mean, you should look at how Google and Amazon are changing our world, right? Uh, one of the things Google does is it watches what I do, right? One of the things that Amazon does when I'm going, when, when I go and buy on their website is it watches, how am I buying? What am I looking at? Uh, how, which products I turn and look into, which products I don't, and the same with Google, right? And what are they doing with that information? They are adapting their experience of that, of their product vis-a-vis uh, -vis me based on this observation, right? And so not, and, and you know, that it is not just that. Sometimes they're actually conducting experiments on me. Uh, I sometimes see a page which you would not see because it is tailored to measure my reaction to a page like that, right? So there's something called A-B testing, right? Which is happening at that point of time. And based on both these observation data that they collect, measurement data and experimental data they collect, they adapt. And, and this is the big idea in my mind when it comes to looking at, thinking about what could and how could AI modify education. The goal is, you know, observe the learner, do experiments with the learner and adapt everything that goes on at that point of time to modify and you know improve the journey of learning, so to speak. 
uh, and and you know uh, every course material that is now out there uh, there is you know capabilities that technology is building uh, or or you know platforms that are being uh, uh, that are available now that that take any topic um, and then they look at you know how many people really learn have understood that topic how many people it seems like have not i mean these color codes for example are showing the number of children who are very comfortable with that topic because they're measuring a lot of different outcomes children who are struggling a little with that topic, children who are really not getting that topic, and some children who have not even tried that topic, right? And, and such measurements and observations are available to instructors now to, to look at and then adapt their approach to teaching and learning. And this is the central idea. The central idea is based on these three things, two, two, two things, right? First of all, observing, observing the learner, and secondly, measuring the learner, right? And all of that sits in the student learning data. And once you have that, right, you can adapt the instructor activities, you can adapt your course material, you can adapt, you know, how you measure how what a student is doing, and you can bring a whole bunch of pedagogy and methodology of science of learning to modify this outcome. And this is the, the this is the, you know, the essential idea, you know, according to me, and that what we are seeing here, you know, in, in our experiences when it comes to how AI is modifying education. Uh, but just to take away, you know, that it's not just all about AI and technology, which is modifying education. It's, it will just be an incomplete theory and actually a wrong one too. Uh, what's really happening is that it is, it has to be a play between data driven approaches which is the area that you see here. Uh, so all these are data-driven approaches, right? So you observe, you measure, you collect data, and then you build models, which are of both types, right? You build causal models and you build explanatory models, right? And then you use this in combination with the theory of education and, and you know, subject matter expertise. And it is this play which brings out or is bringing out revolution in, a, in, a, in education. And then, you know, it, it should not just be called AIs or technology is modifying education. It's also the science, uh, you know, which is giving us hypotheses to look at, and and you, you, as a result of it, we are able to build a better intervention. So, so the big principle in AI in education principle is, you know, observe the learner, measure and adapt, and ensure that the various hypothesis is guided by good education theory, right? And 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 it's not just one, right? So I just wanted to share that idea at some level. So. That being said, right, I mean, you sort of have the point of view of how AI in education is really changing. It's a tremendous opportunity out there at Nagaro and, you know, in our interactions with our customers, we seeing a possibility, which is tremendous. Uh, it is one of the most, uh, uh, you know, health and education are the two most uh, serious areas of investment that are going to change in the next coming years, not so much as, you know, business and trade and government and politics as much as education and health. So, so this is an area worth getting into. Um, I, I'm not going to spend too much time here. I think I have a time constraint as well, um, but there are quite a few uh, interventions uh, whether, uh, you know, that are happening uh, in all of these areas, all of them are built on that principle I just talked to you about, right? Observe the learner, measure the learner, and adapt all those outcomes appropriately. Keep in mind the various educational theories from cognitive science, neuroscience, uh, social theory, and so on, and then just build the outcomes that you're hoping to build. And a lot of good startups are playing uh, are coming out with very interesting ideas in learning areas, in teaching areas, in assessment and evaluation. We see a whole bunch of very interesting AI interventions. And of course, how organizations get run, how organizations in the offline online play are going to come together and so on. Right. Uh, I want to talk to you about two very interesting cases just so that you can get a flavor of what, you know, what kinds of use cases are actively being done, uh, you know, in addition to what I just talked about. Uh, one of them is, you know, um, we work with a very, uh, a a very popular and a, and a very reputed uh, technology institution that is coming up um, soon. Um, and uh, one of the things that we are doing for them is uh, building an automatic trailer generation, right? So you, so uh, people uh, like myself and others come and give talks, and then what you want to do is you want to make. Uh, enough of a punchy trailer out of the talk so that it could, you know, that trailer could inspire people to listen to that video, uh, spend time and so on, right? So uh, it, today it takes a lot of 
time and energy by a creative person to be able to stitch it all together. But with AI, it's possible for us to understand gestures, understand emotions, understand points of interest in a video, and then have the AI stitch it all together in a very interesting way automatically. Um, here's another interesting use case uh, being done with some, uh, you know, uh, um, organizations of uh, higher education in India, uh, the, 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 the famous ones, the IITs and so on. Uh, a lot of course material over the years, um, you know, has uh, come about and a lot of these course materials have very similar topics uh, that they cover. So this particular institution wanted us to uh, understand, uh, help them understand uh, how such an intersection of content looks like across all the different courses that this organization floats. And they have, believe me, you know, thousands of courses with so much intersection in, in topics that, that, you know, that there are. And, and it, you know, if one could understand them, one could simplify it, one could make it more meaningful for children, you know, as they journey through their uh, program and curriculum and make it interesting for them. So, so it's something again that we did. We're very proud to, you know, have been part of all this. And it's one of those areas at Nagaro that we are investing a lot. We get a lot chance to speak to a lot of nonprofits, educational institutes, and, you know, funders in these areas. And, and uh, we were excited by this area in general. We think AI in education is one um, very interesting topic, one very well deserving topic, and something that, you know, we should all be thinking about. So, so that was all from my side. I thought I'd share with you some of these thoughts and ideas that we had, and hopefully it was useful for you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing your valuable knowledge with us today. We would quickly take up some questions. We request all to kindly post your doubts on chat window. So I'm feeling we are giving so much to participants. They, it's getting difficult for them to digest. So no questions at all. Wonderful <laughs> <laughs> insight, sir. Yes, yes, Sridma, please continue. On behalf of Team Education 4.0, we would like to present you with a virtual memento as a token of our gratitude. We request you, sir, to kindly accept. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you, sir. sir. Thank you for accepting our invitation and raising this occasion. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir, for joining us today. With this, we draw through the end of our session by our esteemed guest speakers for Education 4.0. We will now request you all to kindly be with us for the valedictory session. It is an honor for us to invite Dr. Rajri Jain, Professor at SICSR and Secretary India, IEEE India Council to kindly address the gathering. Okay, so like all delegates, I'm also speechless. So, you know, like, uh, good evening, one and all. Uh, I am Dr. Rajeshri Jain, and uh, I, we, cons uh, we actually conceptualize this workshop sometimes in the month of uh, uh, April uh, and May. May 1st was the last deadline when we wanted to submit. So, when we thought and submitted this proposal, we never had, like, it would shape up like this. And after these three days of uh, three days each day uh, workshop, um, I mean, I am absolutely speechless. So I'm so very humbled with uh, the way workshop has uh, shaped up and we have had a little, I mean, uh, elongated type of uh, inauguration session. We could not complete it within the defined time. So I was worried, but then when I uh, looked back and looked into the words that the uh, speakers shared during the inauguration, they were so very important. Otherwise, we would have definitely missed on those. So we started the whole session in the inauguration itself, uh, thinking of uh, the overall change that education system might require uh, considering Indian continent or, for example, from uh, 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 followers uh, to leadership type of education, entrepreneurship based education, reskilling, upskilling and continuing education, which is required in the uh, education 400 domain and uh, 
changing gover governing uh, 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 scenarios like a new education policy coming in. So all those things we could hear within those 40, 45 minutes. And I hope uh, and I was really privileged to listen to all those speakers who could grace our inauguration session uh, from Region 10, uh, Deepak Mathur sir, then uh, Preeti Vajaj ma'am uh, from Region 10 uh, EA uh, board, and then Suresh Nair sir, uh, our own uh, Dr. Saini sir, and also Girish Khilari sir. Uh, amazing uh, inauguration we started with. And that really had set up a very nice tone for the whole three days workshop. So immediately we had uh, from Debar, she's a keynote, which spoke about so many dimensions of uh, uh, coining this word itself, education 400, how to automate the processes of uh, uh, human interactions, you know, like education, teaching, learning is just human interaction, but then there are so many dimensions to it and how could we automate these things? So, and followed by, we could uh, have hands on sessions on Google uh, classroom as well as Moodle open source classrooms. As I stated in my opening remarks and the inauguration day also, this workshop was a very unique platform considering two aspects. One was we covered not only IEEE educational resources, we could bring up from outside world also. You could see we had sessions on uh, uh, Moodle as an open source LMS, Google Classroom. And today itself, we could witness so many of these tools from uh, uh, Radhik, Professor Radhik, as well as Pro Professor uh, Binu. So, I mean, uh, I could say like uh, uh, on, all in all, the whole three days were very, very engaging and I could witness it in the form of uh, a number of attendees also. Like we have had received good uh, registrations of about 500, but we could see that uh, at least we could engage about 100 plus attendees every day. It's not a joke in, uh, in an online education, online webinar, because there are so many webinars around, but yet we could hold attention of 100 plus I consider uh, we are really humbled to have you all for all these three days with us. And, uh, you know, amazing speakers we could uh, actually invite and then they have accepted our invitation and could share their uh, expertise. Just now we have had power packed uh, information on AI in education from uh, Anurag. Uh, I mean, uh, I have no words to, I really need time to uh, digest and then come back and then utilize. Yesterday, Dhanu, whatever suggested in Dhanu Kumar session in the morning, I already implemented, started implementing in my own video creation and then teaching to my students. So slowly we are going to adapt to many of these tools and techniques, definitely, and we will always be connected. And that is one place which I like as far as I could please concern, which gives you so much of a networking opportunity. And believe me, so it is kind of an extended family for me. So uh, I always look forward for uh, such kind of information. I mean, technically packed information from uh, all my friends at IEEE. So volunteering and networking, these are two things which are takeaways for, from IEEE to all of us, uh, for me. So I hope most of you who have uh, uh, joining, who have joined 100 plus people here today, uh, I know like IEEE, most of you are aware of, uh, so this is a largest professional organization and I would request all of you to visit IEEE.org for uh, member benefits and then I'm very uh, uh, glad that uh, we could actually submit it under educational activities of uh, uh, IEEE as a horizontal. So, uh, and then you can see so many uh, initiatives also uh, which are available yesterday, uh, uh, Dr. Amuli already shared uh, that you also can be one of uh, the next uh, workshop organizers. So I would request each one of you to visit these educational resources, which are available on IEEE, including the educational activity board, then try engineering for STEM education, starting from school to middle school to preschool to uh, continuing education for students, and then professional development activities. So that means learning is never ending. So, and you have uh, at least uh, multiple number of resources available in IEEE for each type of learner. So, and we could, uh, I'm very happy that we could cover most of these things over these three days. So without uh, taking much of uh, your time, I would again uh, be very, uh, uh, congratulate all the participants who could uh, get themselves uh, immersed in the knowledge sharing of these three days. Uh, I know like we could not give you hands-on because uh, that is a time constraint, but definitely as a version two or something, we would come up with more hands-on workshops in same education for zero series. 
So, and we I definitely invite all of you uh, to join us in our future initiatives too. I also take, uh, uh, this is not a Thanksgiving, of course, in Thanksgiving, uh, uh, my team will uh, offer those, but then I should, uh, I should actually appreciate the second point, which I mentioned that was, uh, uh, that was about the collaboration. So the whole workshop uh, is, was uh, sponsored by EA uh, of region time and then collaborated by five major organizational units of uh, uh, ITP and our own, my own student branch where I'm working, that is Symbiosis Institute of Computer Studies. So we all have collaborated and then we could bring up this workshop to all of you. I hope this is, uh, this was useful to all of you. We are very, very eager to hear your feedback and basically the whole validatory covers uh, that point. So we want to hear from you and how do we take it ahead as uh, a series or what to do next. So uh, with this, I uh, uh, stop here. And I request uh, all to you, Shritma and then uh, Shatakshi. Thank you so much for uh, this opportunity to me. Thank you so much, ma'am. This workshop was indeed very insightful. Next, with great pleasure, we would like to invite Mr. Kumarappan, Chair IEEE Mantra Section, to share his felicitation message. Uh, uh, respected organizers of this event, Education 4.2, role of the educational technology. It's a very interesting and essential and uh, that to need of the world. Such a wonderful program organized by India Council, joining with a number of sections. And uh, this again sponsored by Artan. That way we feel very happy uh, seeing all the panelists in the invitation. They're wonderful and uh, very relevant panelists selected for this program. Till uh, till now it's went on well. That's what I heard. So that, uh, that is a, this is one of the important program that to in the situation of a pandemic it is essential. Now even the pandemic situation make us to change on the educational 4.0 that is uh, together with the uh, industrial kind of uh, things otherwise any kind of uh, together with the missions we are doing a, a number of wonderful things we never imagined the same pandemic it happened on for a long the long time back there is no technology at all we we, we ne never feel what are what are all the ways we now learn through this uh, pandemic that may not be achieved for that we understand almost some of the percentage the level of education four point zero is reached due, reached due to this pandemic. We are on all this in our field, power engineering side, we are planning to form a smart grid throughout India. That is the next plan. In the next Electricity Act, they are going to implement, the, they are going to include in the act this, the form of smart grid. Already in the smart grid is formed in almost uh, most of the countries in abroad. Once you form a smart grid, smart technologies are essential. Before it is the present system to be made in re-engineering. Once you make a re-engineering, there's a two kinds of a technologies are required. One is communication as well as the electrical, both to be both to be bidirectional. To make a bidirectional, the re-engineering is required on the present kind of a power system, as well as parallelly the communication comes through that only you can make the system as smart, managing the energy in a smart way. But that no doubt about it, the machines are required. Once the machines together with the human join together, then implementing the smart technology in the smart grid, then you really achieve the smart grid. Uh, and as well as all the power wise, everybody become self-satisfied people in the each state wise you look, otherwise country wise you look, they achieve in such a level. That is one of the important technology we are approaching in the name of education 4.0 as well as similarly the artificial intelligence once you start to use artificial intelligence then make expertise in, in number of field once you make ex expertise before the machine and the human being are involved together and make a successful in number of phase in number of fields before now the artificial intelligence is going to play a very important role in this education 4.0 and as well as Next, the robotics. Robotics also plays a very important role. For example, in future, they form a dark factory. 
What do you mean by dark factory means only the robotics it involves. There may be a 24 hours product production. Once they do such a way without any kind of a fault, it goes on running, but that too with the minimum maintenance. Once we start to form such a kind of a dark factories, the machines and human being are controllable on that machines plays a very important role. That is another kind of a education 4.2, 4.0. Therefore, the, such a way you approach it means there is a different kind of method, methodologies are required. Even more than 200 methodology you can form. Even start with even making a learning with school children. They start with a play kind of a learning. The same way you start with any kind of a practical kind of learning, industrial kind of a learning together. Once you make it in, that may be a very successful one for education 4.0. Even we recently organized a section student symposium in our section that we organized a project expo. One of the project expo got the first prize. That project is mentioned about completely on the forming the complete control on the alumnus on a particular college. From the beginning till the end, they based on that, what exactly they have done, such a way they goes on explaining without any theoretical kind of a slides, they only practically and in the utilization point of view, they goes on explaining it. But that's why they got the first prize. Was well, such a way they approach together machine as well as the human being together, they make it as a successful one and in the, in the future, in the educational 4.0. With that, I'll conclude my talk. Thank, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind words. On behalf of Team Education 4.0, we would like to present you with a virtual memento as a token of our gratitude. We request you to kindly accept, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So thank, thank you, you so sir. much, sir, for all the cooperation. You know, like Devra, sir, was one such uh, strong pillar of support to us throughout the planning. Thank you so much. And thank, you, sir. thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank uh, you. And associate with us for whether it is EAB activities or WYE activities. Thank you. So thank much. you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you. you thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for joining us today. Today, we would like to commend and applaud all the participants who joined us for the three day workshop, and we would love to hear from you. I would request our dear participants to share their experience with us. The stage is open to all. Those who want to speak, please write your names on the chat window so that we can go give you unmuting rights. I think uh, Rupa Kulkarni from uh, Bangalore Institute has uh, already uh, written something. If she's able to want to speak, uh, you can unmute her if she's there. Rupa, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Uh, hi, hi. I'm not able to hear you. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, a very good evening uh, to all of you, ma'am. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm really overwhelmed and a lot of uh, learning uh, in these uh, three days. Uh, the resource person were, uh, I mean, uh, really amazing. Uh, though we were in the pandemic and experimented a lot of things on our own on this digital platform, but we got to learn uh, many more uh, new things, uh, new tools that could be taken up. And today's evening session, I was actually, I mean, thinking how should we make our online course very, you know, interactive and uh, Anurag sir and uh, other, I uh, mean, uh, the professor, uh, they put forth their reviews and Doodly was the platform which I uh, learned uh, and I got to know it. Uh, so in all, uh, all the three days uh, were really informative and uh, I mean, uh, truly uh, learning into the uh, field of uh, uh, education uh, 4.0. I would like to thank all the organizers, uh, each one of them uh, for uh, taking a lot of uh, effort in uh, identifying the uh, uh, right uh, resource person for uh, the topic that's being uh, uh, chosen. I guess they were best uh, among uh, 
the all of uh, them so we wish i mean i personally um, uh, congratulate the complete team and hope to see uh, many more uh, such uh, uh, sessions to be a part of it uh, thank you rajeshri ma'am i mean a wonderful work from the complete uh, uh, team and very keen on uh, collaborating uh, as well yeah I'm, I mean, just to introduce, I am uh, working as associate professor in uh, Dayanand Sagar of uh, College of Academy and Technology Management to Bangalore. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for this opportunity as well. Thank you, Dr. Rupa. We will definitely uh, network and continue the collaboration, ma'am. Thank you for your kind words. It means a lot to the whole team. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Go ahead, Swetma. Thank you, ma'am, for sharing your experience with us. Now, we would like to call upon Dr. Abhay Gandhi, Chairman, IEEE Nagpur Subsection, Professor at ECE Department, VNIT. Sir, we welcome you and request you to share your felicitation message. Good evening. I, I hope I am audible and visible. Yes, sir. You're not visible somehow to me. Maybe I think my screen problem. Yes, sir. You're visible. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone, dignitaries and participants. It gives me great, great pleasure to be with uh, all of you. And uh, as uh, we are uh, both uh, in the field of technology as well as education, uh, as uh, the technology evolves, it is very natural that uh, the education methodology also has to evolve. And uh, so just as there is a talk of industry 4.0, obviously everything has to go into the next uh, version. So it is very uh, uh, like uh, interesting and uh, uh, very timely that uh, we are going into uh, this uh, next version and we are thinking about it and uh, although uh, the uh, pandemic gave a huge push uh, for uh, education uh, to shift to the as far at least for content delivery uh, towards the uh, towards the <clears throat> online mode but uh, now uh, the uh, uh, challenge is that uh, how close we can bring this online experience uh, to the in-person experience because all said and done in-person experience is costly or uh, i would say is available to very limited uh, number of people uh, the limitation is there obviously because of the uh, limited physical resources that are available like uh, for example, uh, if uh, I have to conduct class in my institute, hardly 120 people, 140 people at a time uh, I can interact with. But uh, with technology, there is no limit. So, uh, but at the same time, uh, the, the learning experience that comes out of technology, uh, ha as of today, the current perception is that uh, it does not match with uh, the in-person experience. So I believe this is the biggest challenge of uh, uh, getting the advantages of technology because I can reach so many people, thousands of people. I can reach uh, through uh, the online mode, but uh, how can I bring uh, the uh, experience as close as possible to the classroom experience? How do I make sure that uh, students follow all the ethics and uh, the whatever uh, evaluation we do is absolutely like uh, credible uh, because uh, the outside world is always going to question that uh, how did you evaluate the students and how do you know that uh, whatever work was submitted to you whatever answer was submitted to you was really coming from the students so this is another big challenge that uh, how do you establish uh, your evaluation system as a credible system so uh, uh, there are challenges but uh, uh, now the entire education sector has uh, paid its attention to it. And uh, I think uh, the pandemic has been uh, a single factor that pushed all of us towards that. Uh, so this is a very uh, timely kind of uh, program and looking at the uh, feedback from all the participants, uh, 
the program has gone uh, very well. So uh, I congratulate all the organizers. Uh, as a Nakur subsection chair, I am happy to be associated with this activity, and uh, uh, we assure you full cooperation uh, for all the future endeavors, whatever we take up uh, in this uh, field. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to share my views with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. On behalf of Team Education 4.0, we would like to present you with a virtual memento as a token of our gratitude. We request you to kindly accept, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. I accept it very gladly. Thank you thank so you. much, sir. And you, you have really great volunteers. Uh, if Amuli would not have been with me, I don't know like how our workshop would have shaped. So such a great resources, such a great support to this workshop. Thank you so much, Nakpur subsection, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us today. I would again request our dear past participants to share their experiences with us. The stage is open to all. Those who want to sh uh, speak, please write your name on the chat window so that we can give you the unmuting rights. I can see Rajinder Tiwari uh, uh, if he's available. Sritma, yeah, otherwise we can move ahead because uh, we are running short of time also. Yes, ma'am. Now we would like to call upon Mr. Ramni Karla, IEEE Impact Creator, to share his felicitation message. Yeah, uh, am I audible and visible? Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, very greetings to all of you and uh, thank you so much and congratulations to all the organizing team and the collaborators, all the sections and the especially art and education activities for uh, supporting this activity. Uh, I, I still remember the first day when Rashri ma'am uh, approached me regarding this event and I instantly said to her, why not we should collaborate with Tri Engineering? And uh, as a part of Tri Engineering uh, Global Team, it's my pleasure and it's really great to see how this program turned up into a successful ending and a concluding uh, event. And I, I, I would like to congratulate uh, to Rajshri ma'am and all the collaborators. Uh, I was thinking about the remarks and I, I thought like all the things are already covered in a lot of three days and uh, Every single professor and every single participant over the call have gained a lot of things which they can implement directly in their classrooms and in directly there in colleges and online classes. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to remark on. I would like to reflect some remarks on uh, the PVN model of IEEE, uh, which I uh, discovered from my IEEE experience when I, I graduated uh, in 2019, and uh, it's it's like it stands for participation, volunteering, and networking. So specifically, every single of IEEE member is really proudly uh, always participate, always volunteer and network. And IEEE is one of the great grounds where each one of you over the call can collaborate, can become member and uh, can get hands on on numerous technologies, numerous, uh, I would say, methodology which you can use in your organization, in your research work. And uh, as correctly said by uh, Kumar Appan, sir, Rajshri ma'am and Abhay sir, it's it's the it's the kind of the gift which we IEEE platform give to all non IEEE members to network with a lot of great uh, personalities, great leaders across the globe onto one platform. And I I won't say it's a limitation during the pandemic, but it's a advantage for IEEE entities to host such great events virtually, and uh, it's able to connect to all, with each other of us. And uh, from Tri Engineering team, it's my great privilege that we collaborate with Education 4.0 uh, event. And uh, over to that, uh, I would like to conclude my remarks by sharing one of the golden opportunity with all of the professors and uh, teachers over the call uh, of one of the 
one of the global opportunity uh, under IEEE, which was uh, kick-started by Dr. Amla Tamari Muthu, ma'am. She is the secretary of IEEE Computer Society. The competition IEEE SS12. Uh, I would request and I would like to uh, encourage each and every professor over the call to go through the website which I shared in the chat window after the session, uh, which can motivate a lot of students in your connection, a lot of students of your college institution to get hands-on on project-based learning. Because my personal experience from my 10th class, since my 10th class, it's being all about PBA learning approach. And project-based learning actually helped me out to get into uh, Vipro organization. Now I am working as a cloud support associate at Amazon. And it's, it's, it's what should I say? I'm speechless about IEEE. IEEE has given me a lot of things and it's my fifth year going on in IEEE. And thank you so much. Uh, with that, I would like to conclude and congratulate uh, to every collaborator and organizing committee. And thank you so much to all the speakers and the guests uh, to share their remarks uh, under the banner of Education 4.0. Thank you, Ramnik, and you being the uh, face of young professionals in the group, you know, like you could motivate students, you could give those guidelines for marketing, uh, and we really are happy to have you among us as team member during the uh, three days workshop. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. It's my pleasure, and uh, it's all about IEEE, cross learning and networking. Absolutely. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. Education 4.0 would not have been possible without the dedication, efforts, and hard work put in the endeavors by our student volunteers under the expert guidance of the organizing committee who mentored us with their magnificent counsel. So now we invite you all to indulge yourselves in a short video having an amalgamation of the experiences shared by the Education 4.0 team. I think you guys need to manage that uh, sound, no? like the way we did it. I'm the student volunteer for the IEEE student branch of the Symbiosis Institute of Computer Studies and Research, Pune. My experience volunteering with Education 4.0 was absolutely wonderful. Chance to collaborate and work with professionals and IEEE volunteers from different regions, different sections was truly an amazing experience. It really allowed me to broaden my horizons. I hope I can continue working with IEEE again in the future on similar events. Greetings of the day, everyone. My name is Shatakshi Vishwakarma, and I'm a student member from IEEE SICSR Pune Student Branch. I was a student volunteer in the designing team for Education 4.2 event, and it was a really wonderful experience to be a part of the same, as it helped me in enriching and enhancing my skill sets, and also in channelizing my potential in a great way. I'm really grateful to the organizing committee who provided me with the expert guidance and also to the volunteering committee who helped me and supported me throughout the course of the event. Thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Aishi Kare and I'm from SICSR Pune. I'm currently a BCA second year student. Volunteering in Education 4.0 event has been an amazing experience for me. I was a part of design team where our work mainly focused on designing posters and momentum. Working with the team has been a great opportunity as we supported and helped each other while working on the design plan. It has been a different experience for me as the team respected each other's ideas and worked on them together. I am grateful to be a part of such great opportunity. Thank you. Hello all, I am Sahil Lakhani and I am volunteer as a tech team member and as an anchor at IEEE Education 4.0 event. IEEE events are always fun. IEEE events it is an amazing platform to enhance new skills. It allowed me to enhance my teamwork skills as well as problem solving skills. It is my honor to be a volunteer at IEEE events. Hello everyone, this is Tanu Gupta, student volunteer from IEEE student branch, Sri Ramdhava College of Engineering and Management, Nagpur. I am thankful for getting a chance to work with different volunteers across different sections due to Education 4.0 and the knowledge and experience I gained was truly amazing. I got a chance to work with a group of people having relevant skills and all the coordinators and mentors were truly supporting and helpful. So thank you very much and looking forward for much more opportunities. Thank you. Hello everyone. I am Shreyas Kaur, IEEE member of SP Student Branch. 
from SBJN Institute of Technology Management and Research Lab. Working with Education 4.0 team was wonderful and amazing experience. I got a chance to work with these professionals and talented people. Thank you team for making me a part of it. Thank you. Hello, I am Nyayeshwari Yelne and I am part of IEEE Nagpur Subsection Students Activity Committee. Education 4.0 was a great experience. I was a part of the publicity team and was asked to publicize the event all over my network. Also, I did anchoring for day two of the workshop. Volunteering for Education 4.0 helped me develop important social skills and also I gained valuable work experience all at the same time. Also, my co-volunteers were very cooperative in all aspects. Thank you, IEEE and Education 4.0 for giving me this opportunity. Hello, everyone. This is Tarun from IEEE Madras. Actually, it is a great experience as a volunteer working with the organizing team of Education 4.0. Especially, I would like to thank um, Dr. Devaraj sir for encouraging me to take part in this. And I would like to thank everybody for this video truly summarizes our experience with organizing this wonderful event. These are all our student volunteers. And my, uh, from bottom of my heart, art, I would, uh, I, I'm really a speechless again uh, would like to put on record the support received by my team this is my team thank you so much you all did a very excellent great job uh, i hope all the organizing committee members i would request all of you to open up your cameras and clap for this team so without them definitely this event would not have been possible yes thank you thank you volunteers Yes, for making it a grand success. Thank you so much. From behalf of all the student members, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Next, these are all uh, our organizing committee members. Thank you so much for taking, making these beautiful posters within no time, you know, like, thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Next, we would now like to felicitate all the teachers and student volunteers who helped to carry out this workshop successfully. Can you, can you hold on? I will just uh, check with uh, Sachin, sir. Uh, thank you. I'm here. Hey, sir, I was on mute. Uh, good evening, Sachin, sir. So good I evening. was just requesting, is it okay another five minutes we'll spend on felicitating all the volunteers and then have other no. Yes, yes, sir. Sure. Yes, sir. Yes. Continue. This memento is presented to Dr. Rajeshri Jain, Professor and Branch Counselor at Symbiosis Institute of Computer Studies and Research. Secretary, IEEE India Council. Ma'am, kindly accept this token of appreciation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I am overwhelmed to receive this. This memento is presented to Dr. Amori Belsare, Educational Activity Committee Chair, IEEE Nagpur Subsection. Ma'am, we request you to kindly accept the token of appreciation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Team Education 4.0. This memento is presented to Dr. Prerna Gaur, Educational Activities Committee Chair, IEEE Delhi, Director at NSUT East Campus. Ma'am, kindly accept this token of appreciation. This memento is presented to Dr. D. Devraj, Educational Activities Committee Chair, IEEE Madras Section. So we request you to kindly accept the token of appreciation. Thank you. It was a very nice experience uh, in working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. 
This memento is presented to Dr. Rachana Garg, I Chair, IEEE Delhi Section. Ma'am, kindly accept this token of appreciation. With the next memento, we would like to present it to Dr. Neha Sharma, Secretary, IEEE Pune Section. Ma'am, kindly accept this token of appreciation. The next memento is presented to Mr. Girish Khilari, Chairman, IEEE Pune Section. Sir, kindly accept this token of appreciation. This memento is presented to Dr. Amar Bhutre, Treasurer, IEEE Pune Section. Sir, we request you to kindly accept the token of appreciation. This memento is presented to Dr. Josephine Sele, Assistant Professor, Kalasalingam University. Ma'am, kindly accept this token of appreciation. This memento is presented to Mr. Ramni Kalra, the IEEE Impact Creator Outreach Publicity Advisor. Sir, so, request you to kindly accept this token of appreciation. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, team, for such a uh, great memory. And congratulations again to everyone. Thank you. This memento is presented to Dr. Jatinder Kumar Saini, sir, Director, Symbiosis Institute of Computer Studies and Research. Sir, kindly accept this token of appreciation. Thank you, sir, for all the support. Without that, this event would never have been so successful. Thank you so much. With the next memento, we would like to present it to Professor Dr. Sachin Nayak, Deputy Director, Symbiosis Institute of Computer Studies and Research. Sir, we request you to kindly accept this token of appreciation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for all the support. This memento is presented to Mr. Virendra Shete, IEEE Education Society, IEEE Pune Section. Sir, kindly accept this token of appreciation. Now, we will be presenting our vote of thanks to all the student volunteers. This memento this is... Oh, yes, sorry. This memento is presented to Ms. Meghna Das, Chair, Registration Team Lead, IEEE SICSR Pune Student Branch. This memento is presented to Mr. Vekun Goel, Registration Team... Okay. This memento is presented to Ms. Simin Khanayoub, Vice Chair and Secretary, Design Team Lead, IEEE SICSR Pune Student Branch. Thank you. It was a great pleasure for, for me working with different volunteers of different sections. Thank you. This memento is presented to Ms. Sridhama Sengupta, IEEE Site Secretary and Content Team Lead, IEEE SICSR Pune Student Branch. Thank you. Thank you so much. This memento is presented to Chavi Trivedi, Webmaster, Technical Team Lead, IEEE SICSR Pune Student Branch. Thank you so much. It's an honor. For the next memento, we would like to present it to Ms. Dia Suthiv, Treasurer and Membership Development Lead, Publicity Team Lead, IEEE SICSR Student Branch. The next memento is presented to Aditi Kanojia, IEEE WI Secretary, IEEE SICSR Pune Student Branch. The next memento is presented to Mr. Vaikunt Goyal, Registration Team, IEEE SICSR Pune Student Branch. The next memento is presented to Satakshi Vishwakarma, Design Team, IEEE SICSR Pune Student Branch. Thank you so much for the honor. With the next memento, I would like to present it to Ms. Ayushi Kare, Design Team, IEEE SICSR Pune Student Branch. The next memento we would like to present to Ayush Sachdeva, Design Team, IEEE SICSR Pune Student Branch. The next memento is presented to Mr. Adarsh Khandekar, Design Team, IEEE Bombay section, IEEE Nagpur subsection. 
The next memento is presented to Raipata Basu Content Team, IEEE SICSR Pune Student Branch. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you very much, everyone, for this wonderful opportunity. The next memento is presented to Mr. Sahil Akhani, Technical Team, IEEE SICSR Pune Student Branch. Thank you, Education 4.0 team, and thank you, all the organizing committee, for the opportunity. The next memento is presented to Gondrala Tarun Shini Vasulu, Technical Team, IEEE Madras Section. Next memento is presented to Mr. Shreyas Bhoyer, Technical Team, IEEE Bombay Section and IEEE Nagpur Subsection. The next memento is presented to Samiksha Molik, Technical Team, IEEE Pune Section. The next memento is presented to Mr. Shivraj Theri Ashil Patil, Technical Team, IEEE Pune Section. The next memento is presented to Saurav Kumar, Publicity Team, IEEE SICSR Pune Section. The next memento is presented to Ms. Dhyaneshwari Yilne, Publicity Team, IEEE Bombay Section, IEEE Nagpur Subsection. The next memento is presented to Tanu Gupta, Publicity Team, IEEE Bombay Section, IEEE Nagpur Subsection. With the next memento, we would like to present it to Mr. Arani Hari Prasad Vignesh, Publicity Team, IEEE Madras Subsection. Now, we would like to invite Professor Dr. Sachin Nayak, sir, Deputy Director, Symbasis Institute of Computer Studies and Research, to deliver the word of thanks. Uh, just one minute. So, uh, while Sir is delivering his vote of thanks, I would request all volunteers to be moved to panelists so that we can have uh, one screenshot later on. Over to you, Dr. Sachin. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam. Uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, it's my honor to offer vote of thanks for this IEEE R10 ESC sponsored capacity building workshop, Education 4.0, role of uh, Educational Technologies hosted by IEEE SICSR Student Branch, Educational Activities and Education Society of IEEE Pune Section in association with uh, Educational Activity Committees of IEEE Delhi, IEEE Madras Section, IEEE Nagpur Subsection and Indian uh, Council, sorry, India Council. On behalf of uh, Symbiosis Institute of Computer Studies and Research, I would like to thank the Arcane Educational Activity Committee and IEEE Pune section for giving us uh, this opportunity to conduct uh, this three-day uh, workshop. We are indeed privileged to have the presence of Ms. Uh, Mr. Deepak Thakur, Director IEEE R10, Dr. Priti Baja, Chair Educational Activity Committee, IEEE R10, Mr. Suresh Nair, Chairperson, IEEE India Council, Chairs, and EA coordinators of all collaborating sections and council either during inauguration or valedictory. Our helpful, heartfelt uh, thanks to all. Uh, this event would not have been a success without your blessings and grace. I extend my hearty gratitude to all the speakers of sharing their valuable insights with this uh, with the attendees of this workshop, your acceptance and presence has made our workshop success, attracting over uh, 500 registrations and more than 150 plus uh, attending uh, the workshops uh, every day. Once again, uh, take, I take this opportunity to thank IEEE Pune section, uh, Mr. Girish Kilari, uh, sir, Dr. Neha Sharma, Dr. Amar Buchade, Dr. Viren Shete sir, and all exam members uh, from IEEE Pune section for their constant support and guidance to our SICSR uh, student branch. We also thank uh, to put on a record uh, the support received by IEEE India Council and uh, Dr. Suresh Nair and Dr. Devraj. Indeed, the more uh, notices we sent uh, through the India Council help us to reach uh, many people 
and we could get uh, good registrations uh, for this uh, workshop. Dr. Uh, Rachna Gurg, Chair, IEEE Delhi Section. Dr. Uh, Prerna Gaur, your support and connections to great speakers was indeed uh, very valuable uh, for us. Thank you so much. Dr. Kamarapan and Dr. Devraj, your mentoring uh, has helped us uh, to plan this event. Uh, thank you for your support. Dr. Abhay Gandhi, Dr. Amoli Belsare, Madam, uh, you have uh, been a constant support for connecting us with IEEE region EA policies and correcting us at uh, numerous occasions. Uh, thank you. Uh, student volunteers under the leadership of uh, Ms. Megan, uh, along with the members from all uh, I uh, collaborating sections, you have done uh, really a good job, wonderful job. The design, meeting links, content preparation, communications, registrations, as well as certificate uh, processings, all are very unique. Your team rocked, uh, keep up uh, the good work. We need your excellent support even for the future endeavors, especially our upcoming conference uh, 2021 IEEE second Temps Met, uh, which is uh, going to be happen in the month of uh, December. I would like to thank Dr. Rajeshi Jain, uh, Madam from SICSR, who was uh, one of the pillar for support for all the happenings which are uh, going at SICSR. Thank you, Madam. It has been our tribute to host all the members and audience of uh, the workshop. I'm thankful to all participants for coming here and uh, attending this event. We are blessed to have renowned identity from academia, industry, and uh, other areas. I'm very much thankful to the entire organizing committee for uh, as well as sponsors of this event, uh, without uh, whose uh, continuous support, uh, this uh, uh, event wouldn't have been possible. Uh, we value everyone and every moment uh, that has come in this Temple of Learning Education 4.0 role of educational uh, technologies. Thanks to all. Thanks one again. Over to. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing such kind and encouraging words with us. As we draw towards the end of day three workshop, we would sign off as the anchors for the day. We would request you all to attend all the attendees to fill up the feedback form for the session. The link for the feedback form has been provided in the chat box. Take care and stay safe. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hoping to see you soon. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So volunteers are moved to panel. Thank you so much, Amar sir. For I have seen you joining all the three days. Thank you so much. Uh, can you move Amar sir also to the panel, please? Hello, Chavi. Ma'am, I couldn't find him. I think okay, no problem. So I think uh, can we have uh, one? Can we request each one of you to open your video or so that we can take a screenshot? Prerna ma'am. I'll call Prerna ma'am just a minute. Without her, it would be incomplete. Sahil, please open up your camera. Rupa ma'am, Simin, Simin, please open your camera. Chavi. I think it's it's like, her. I guess it's like more than one year. We, we haven't seen the human faces together. <laughs> we are <laughs> we only are seeing enough them to on see screen. the profile you know, pic. Yeah. We are seeing only them on screen. 
Yeah. Yes. So, who is uh, clicking the photograph? Technical team, Chavi. Yes, ma'am. I'll I'll do. Okay, go ahead. On count of three. Yes. Two, one. I triple E. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, John, staying back, and uh, thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Amuli, ma'am, it was great. You know, like such a great teamwork. <laughs> I really enjoyed. Thank you, thank you, ma'am, for thank you, ma'am, thank the you, opportunity thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. to work thank with you. us. Bye bye. Thank you, John. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you, Devrat sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank, thank you, everyone. Yes. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye, Ramne. Yeah. So I could still see around uh, another uh, almost how many are there? The many in the okay.